cause offense to people unnecessarily by cursing and swearing and using oh that naughty, that's different i can naughty I can words stop and... cursing and swearing I, i'm i can do that <laughs> good because we're live now <laughs> speaking of meritorious actions <laughs> well you know it's just a silly thing to get judged over i think mm -hmm. i agree yeah yeah unfortunately Right. Virtue signaling right. Doesn't Positive have and a, negative, right? Yeah. Well, virtue signaling doesn't have a canon. <laughs> you know. That's true. That was kind of like, uh, I mean, that's been a long standing virtue signal. And mm -hmm. think about how many people are like, oh, I'm so insulted by Luther because he uses naughty words. Right. You know, that was back in his day. That was 500 well, years ago. As a, as a friend says, if the world's too big for you, go sit in your car and wait for me to finish. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. I just. <sighs> It's, it kind of feels like, Lindsay didn't point this out, but somebody else pointed this out, is that the the degree to which things have accelerated, even since January. Yeah, right. I, th I think most of us, at least myself, I thought, yeah, we've got till s early summer, fall before things really blast off. And then just we in thought, the last we month, thought. Yeah. We thought five to 10 years on some of this stuff, right? Like yeah. passport, vaccine passports and whatever. Yeah, but then like, the no. CA is like, no, we totally got a chip. <laughs> You're like, wait, slow down. It wasn't dude. CIA. It was uh, Do <clears throat> uh, DARPA. DARPA, that's right. Yep. With defense. More than Defense fall. development. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Aaron likes Epiphany. I do like Epiphany is the most popular blend. Well, no, I think I think fifteen seventeen's overtaken it now. <clears throat> Just but. a reminder to everyone who uh, wasn't here last week. I proposed the Poo Brew breakfast blend, and uh, I think if we you're, can you're, the, it, make this go viral, I think we can really. I think we can push this through. Look, I'm, I'm not. Mm, it would be a specialty blend exclusively available on the Warrior Priest podcast. <laughs> Poo brew. I'm just saying. P-O-O -O brew. Poo brew. <laughs> it's clever. I, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I'm telling you, for Father's Day, you market that like a month or two before Father's Day, you're going to sell out. <laughs> I love this. Good morning. Let's talk evil. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, well said. Steve may have been clued in last night about what we're going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't quite get through the essay last week, did we? No. No. Uh, it's uh, it, you know as an as a side note, and I mentioned this on the podcast, but that my alter guild at this point is essentially my Muay Thai students. <laughs> it's the women in my Muay Thai class that essentially are my alter guild. Oh my! And to just look around my congregation on Sunday mornings and see the people that are in combat martial arts with me, and and know that yeah okay this is good. I'm, I've got this militia now in the church. Well, I've, and I mean, doesn't <laughs> it make sense in a way? I mean, I know it's it's kind of this bizarre world that you've created, but. Um, but it's also it also makes some it's sense. Old school, babe. You want to talk about middle e medieval, middle ages? I'm full yeah, I on suppose. Ages here. No, but I, what, I, what I mean is <clears> that it's um, uh, how do you want to put it? It has this. Well, there's the gospel, and then there's discipline, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Correct. the law, and the, you have the law, and you actually mm -hmm. um, exercise yourselves in the law. Correct, hundred percent. The the best way to love your neighbor is to. Be prepared and equipped to protect your neighbor and sacrifice yourself for the sake of your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this well. is the very nature of selflessness. In fact, you know, you know for a fact when you do something, whether what it is that you're doing is selfish or selfless, because you know your intent. Even if other people Nobody can't else does, see it, yeah. Yeah. you know your intent. You know, and I think this is the hard the the hard reality or the hard truth, the uncomfortable truth for people is that you're either doing something selfishly or selflessly. There is no gray area. And you know because mm. of your intent whether what you're doing is selfish or selfless. You do. I think it's, it's your intent. Can it be both at the same time? No. Because Not more or less, one or the other, just both? I think you can start off by saying, I'm going to do this because I want to do it for this person, but I want to do it for this person because it makes me feel good to do stuff for this person. That, but now it's flipped, yeah. But the very act of it, it's kind of like flow state, in my opinion, is that selflessness mm. is essentially a, a, a kind of flow state in the fact that I recognize you need help and I immediately go to help you. And I don't think, okay, this is going to be rewarding for me. In yeah. fact, sometimes you think to yourself, this is going to be a lot of extra work for me. And I'll then you push you that. that down because you don't, you don't consider that a priority. And then you go to that person or whatever and say, I'm here and I'm prepared to sacrifice to walk with you or to teach you or to, to do what's necessary to help you out of the situation. That's yeah. true selflessness. And your intent is selfless. But as soon as you say, I'm going to go help that person because this is my opportunity to do something for them that's going to make me feel, it's going to bend back on me. I'm going to earn something. I'm going to get a thanks. I'm going to get a present or whatever. It's purely selfish. It doesn't matter what you'd say to yourself or whatever. Oh, it, like, it, it completely destroys the original intent. Is what Correct. You're and that's what I'm saying is that okay. true love must be 
Well, true unconditional love has to be wholly spontaneous. However, in the build-up to it, you are preparing yourself. That's the discipline aspect. You're preparing yourself for those moments when you're called to serve your neighbor in a self-sacrificial way. Got and it. if you're not, you're going to run away from the fight because you're afraid. And that's entirely selfish, obviously. And I was just thinking about, you evil. mentioned flow state. You know, for me, mm -hmm. uh, we haven't started recording yet, by the way. The um, Oh, that I've mastered the art of procrastination as a flow state. Mm -hmm. There you go. Which which is like, well, it's entirely selfish, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause, right. Because I just like being not doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, I actually don't. I, it's a masochistic like. Is that well, right? I think, well, I think I was meditating on this this morning, actually, is that the the laziest people by nature are the most disciplined people by actions. Because the more lazy you are by nature, the more you have to actually force yourself to commit to something to do it consistently. People that are... Hmm. kind of like uh, a, a, a dog let off the leash, so to speak. They're just going to run and run and run and run. They don't have a procrastinating bone in their body. They're always doing, 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 doing. They usually lack discipline, though, because they get so caught up in the doing that they don't ever take time to reflect on why they're doing it. They just do because that's what you oh, do. It's I like see. the it's whole suburban work yeah. ethic. you got to right. be doing something. Right. Versus right. when you're lazy, like you said, or not lazy, but you're a procrastinator. You look at things and you're like, ah, oh, Really? You're actually kind then, of paralyzed by deci the decision about what is the priority. Sure. Sometimes. Yeah. Which is what forces you then to say, okay, I know this is good for me. I know I'm going to feel better after I do this. I know this is beneficial. So just do it. And then you build up this bank of discipline and this bank of willpower. And yeah, you work through the time. logic of it and then mm -hmm. yeah, establish it through repetition. Because you listen to David Goggins talk, for example, and Goggins mm -hmm. is the perfect example of a procrastinator and a lazy person who then basically forced himself through repetition to become this super athlete. Right, but he took the, I mean, he did identify this is something that mm -hmm. that that matters and I'm gonna right. intensely focus upon it and I'm gonna stick to it, mm -hmm. right? And he made that commitment to it, mm -hmm. but but he it wasn't like it was just some stupid thing that he was just kept doing over and over no, he, without he thinking. He found a greater cause, a higher cause. Right, but then, he, but he was ideologically committed to it. Right. Well, exactly, because you have something that's higher, greater than yourself. Your ambition is greater than what you can imagine for your life. And then once you mm -hmm. start to check off those accomplishments, all of a sudden you realize you've been establishing a baseline for your ambitions that's way below what you're actually capable of, which then propels you to do more. Well, yeah, but that's the other hard part about it is that he had, um, it wasn't, in, well, almost impossibly high uh, mm -hmm. expectations that he established for himself. Correct. Right. But that, but otherwise, like, where you go, mm -hmm. just right. kind of where do you, spinning up. your wheels. Well, and, but the dark side of this too, for is it's not all up. Is I think the dark side is that it can lead to an extreme form of narcissism. Mm -hmm. Right. In that now, all of a sudden, you become the the benchmark for everything around you, and so you don't have any sympathy for people that aren't at your level, or aren't willing to aspire to your level, or aren't committed to at least putting forth the effort. Right. And all of a sudden, again, it's, it's I, me, my, and it's just this constant point of reference where you become impossible to live with or even be <laughs> around because your, your standard for yourself is so high, but then you expect everyone else to come to that standard. This isn't self-reflection, is it? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> <Self> therapy, <laughs> Donovan Riley, live on right, YouTube. We're going to grab something. Um, Keep going. But no, it's, it's a, something that you have to constantly, I think you and I were talking about it even yesterday or the day before of... Um, your, you know, what you tolerate in your presence becomes your standard. And I've lived by that for five years now, six years now. Yeah, I got that. So whatever you tolerate right. in your presence becomes your standard. But at the same time, I think, again, the dichotomy is, like we talk about, you can become so self-reflective and so, you go so deep within yourself that you actually do become narcissistic. And then you tolerate nobody in your presence who's not like you or up to your standard. And I think that's a, that's a very dangerous place to, to exist in because... Right. Your standard's constantly changing because you're constantly pushing yourself. And so your accomplishments and your ambitions are constantly changing and growing. Right. But those people around you are not. They're static for the most part. I've, or I've their had changes this. are so incremental that you look at it like a baby going from crawling to sitting up or from laying on his stomach to sitting up. Whereas I've had this with congregation really people, though. Where, yeah, where they're like, Pastor, you're, I mean, they're almost like overwhelmed. It's like, you know too much yeah. and you're, you're throwing yes. too much at me and I can't you keep too up. Much, and you know too much, yeah. 
Yeah. And they're like, well, get what you get. And yeah. the next time I say it, you'll better understand. Right. And right. it'll build. But like, yeah, it's like drinking from the fire hose sometimes, but that's okay. Mm. Right. Like, you know, but it's that, it, it's that reflective, it's reflexive judgment in the sense of mm, okay. when people interface with you, they feel judged because they don't measure up to you. They're comparing themselves to you. I suppose and that's true. And their in and of itself is, I think one of the most detrimental aspects of our society, especially social media is mm -hmm. your entire baseline for your ambitions, your life, your existence are determined by other people and how you compare to other people. And this is the point that we were just talking about this on Saturday at the gym is that I'm the oldest person at my gym and yet I'm 90% better than people half my age at my gym by the standards of the people at my gym who say that to me. Mm -hmm. So now when I'm around other 50 year olds, the expectation that I carry around with me at all times of other 50 year olds is that you're beneath me. You're just beneath me. Ambition wise, life wise, existence wise, productivity, priorities, everything. You're talking objectively. Yes. Objectively. You are objectively beneath me <laughs> and I can prove it. Mm -hmm. That's the narcissistic. That's the old Adam right. coming out and saying, I'm now the new baseline and you have to come up to my baseline, which can become extremely detrimental to your church if you take that into the pulpit with you and you're not conscious of it when you're preparing the sermon, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, or, you're not dragging people style. along, but but I, right. I look at it as more like, you know, I mean, Versus, not a buffet. I think, I'm not well, a buffet line. I try to offer, I try to offer mm -hmm. the best mm -hmm. and say, you know, and what you get, you get. I mean, I. Mm -hmm. it's like it's like children in church though, right? Is that mm -hmm. we have this, we, we took this progressive mentality and we say, well, you know, you have to dumb everything down for the lowest common denominator in your group, right? <laughs> Which, Which are the children. Which is said by the person who's really implicitly saying, I'm the lowest I'm person. I'm a moron, I'm, right. Yeah, I'm a moron, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I'm a moron. Um, so you need to talk to me like I'm a moron. I'm like, well, you're, you, you don't need to stay a moron. And there was an interview with a former NFL guy. I can't remember his name I was listening to. Um, you know, who's made some great strides after retiring from the NFL in mm -hmm. business, right? But he was like a 2-2 in college that mm -hmm. was his grade right. point average i mean he's yeah. really he said i'm just i'm kind of an idiot but i just 100%. work hard and i pursue yeah. it and i'm like i and he's just offended by the idea that people saying you can't you can't actually attain right. because you know because you're underprivileged or you're part of a um right. you know a depressed class or something i was like mm -hmm. that's not it's not even true it's like look mm -hmm. i made it in the nfl by working hard right mm -hmm. and i'm working in business not everybody's going to but you know, to tell people that they can't, that mm -hmm. they're systematically being oppressed, mm -hmm. it's that whole comparison game, and it's and it's and it's comparison from the top down. So it's the people right. who are it's above aspirations. Who it's downward aspirations. Well, it's but it's actually repressive. Well, that's exactly right because you're going yeah. down. You're appealing right. to the bottom as a virtue. So get to the right. bottom because the, all the virtue is at the bottom, not at the top. Well, now we're getting, and now we're actually are getting into evil ideologies. So we that's what I'm probably, saying. You know, probably start a show. I was an A and B student in junior high, and then I got to ninth grade and learned about punk rock, and decided I didn't want to be like everybody else because I didn't really like anybody else in my right. group. So I rebelled, right. and then I graduated from high school with a 2.0 because I didn't care. And then my counselor, my high school guidance counselor said, you can't be an archeologist or anthropologist. The best that you could be is like a, a trades person. And remember in 1988, 89, going to vote after high school was essentially saying you're too dumb to go to college. That's the, kind of what we were taught. So if you go in the military or you go to Votech, you're dumb. The smart kids go to university and then the dumb kids go to Votech or, you know, go in the military. That's what yeah, we were taught. Yeah, who's laughing now? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Let me show you the plumber's house down the road for me, holy cow. It's a yeah. palatial estate. But um, so then I get to college and my first four year degree, I barely graduated from college with a 2.3 or something like that. But mm -hmm. then when I came back from being a missionary and figured out some things about life by living outside the United States, then I was an A student because I didn't care about anybody else anymore. I just was driven. Like you said, you, you're driven to prove everybody that told you you can succeed wrong because in my case, I allowed that voice to determine the future for me in high school and then my first four years in college, well, you're, you're not going to be an A student. You can't be an A student. So then my attitude is like, well, fine, then I'll just be this person from now on and I'll be the mm -hmm. fly in the ointment mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and I'm yeah. not going to care. I'll just, I'll just float through and, and do what I need to do to get by. But then you come back, like in my case, you come back and you're more mature, you're more experienced, you're seasoned that, you know, all of a sudden you realize, oh, that voice isn't true. Like I can be better than this because I just did this amazing thing that I didn't think I was capable right. of. 
Right, so then right. you know, all of a sudden you start getting straight A's. And now again, you've a standard, you've established a new baseline. I'm not a 2.3 student. I'm a 4.0 student, 4.1 student. What else can I do? And then all of a sudden you keep pushing and you keep pushing and you keep pushing and you get to a point where you're like, well, eventually the bottom's going to fall out, right? Right. And it doesn't, at least not in my case, it doesn't. And like we you know, circle back around, it's, not holding other people to your standards, but recognizing that the people that don't want to meet you there are never going to be your friends or your acquaintances. And they've determined for themselves, these are my ambitions. This is my baseline. And I don't want to go above this. And That's I don't want hear, you, though. well, I don't want you to challenge that. And I don't want you to push me or pressure me into doing that. Cause that's your thing. That's not my thing. And I don't see why you have to constantly be judging me about this and it's like, well, I'm not judging you. I'm just living and I hold myself to this standard because reasons and I'm going to continue to, you know, progress and, and develop in this direction and grow in this direction because yeah. I want to be better. And it's kind of fun actually to find out how much more you can go, how much more you can grow and how much more you can accomplish. It's weird. It's almost like a drug versus aspiring downward. It's a similar mindset. It's a similar kind of dopamine hit. It's just that you've determined that aspiring downward, getting to the bottom the fastest, is in itself the highest virtue. Well, we actually have a word for that, right? We call it a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's well, ultimately, it's just sad. <laughs> well, it used to be a mental illness. Now it's a social ethic. Oh. You know, That's when you go to, to recovery, everybody in recovery is has aspired downward for a long time. <laughs> And one of the most difficult aspects of sobriety then when you're first sober, especially is accepting that what you've done to yourself is not normal and it's not determinative of your mental state, your intellect, your heart, anything. It's just that you chose these drugs, you chose this life that, that comes with these drugs and that life leads you down. It doesn't lead you up, which is why it's called yeah. hitting bottom. But it's the same yeah. thing is that if you hit bottom as an addict and then you start to work your way out of that back into sobriety, all of a sudden you're sober three months, six months, a year, two years. And all it's, again, it becomes like a, like a, a mystery almost of like, well, I wonder what I can do next. Cause if I, I didn't think I could get clean and sober, I got clean and sober. I didn't think I could and you end up, you just, I guess you feel like you left everybody else behind at some point. hundred percent. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not isolation. It's solitude. You feel like you live in constant solitude, even in a room full of people because you can't relate to anybody anymore. Well, at least of that group, right? Mm -hmm. The the passive 100%. type. Well, and, and, and whether they're sober or not, I suppose, right? I mean, you, you have the same that ethic. Lot, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with no, people who aren't even sober. Way, yeah. 100% is like, if you're not with me getting punched in the face regularly, then you can't possibly understand my mindset because it's a whole other kind of mindset to go into that day after day after day after day. And well, that's fair and enough. And make a, you know, make a, yeah. make a, a living off of it and so forth. It's a different mindset. And just like being a farmer, being a dairy farmer is a different kind of mindset and getting up at all hours of the day and night to milk and understanding what's necessary for, you know, t for your cows to produce the milk that you need and what you need to do in, in getting the milk from the cow to the, to the co-op and have, get it into the co-op so that they can process it and well, so forth. So isn't the key to humility there is just to admit that you, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. I think so. You know? But again, that's that, it's that the, the, the judgment of comparisons hmm. rather than respect what another person has accomplished. Like I look at dairy farmers or big animal vets or whatever, and I'm just like, I really respect what you do because I just don't have it within me to even aspire to that. Well, they actually understand system science in a way that we don't. <laughs> so much, yes. Because there's because so it's complicated. Because you've got everything. You've got environment. Yeah. You've got you got weather. You've got animals, of course, mm -hmm. who don't always you know don't operate uh, in mm -hmm. linear ways. And, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and according to rules, you know. So but, that's interesting. But this is this goes back to the whole you know you aspire downward, you aspire to the bottom, and then you establish that as a virtue. So everyone's rushing towards that. And then mm -hmm. anybody who tries to aspire upward, the thing is then what ends up happening is you don't follow them because it requires too much discipline, too much work, too much effort. And then this, this divide is created between the two of you. And so everyone that's aspiring towards the bottom, which is usually about 99% of the population, 
they look at that uh, that one percent as they're the outliers they're the people that are on the outside looking in they're the people that are are pursuing something that's not healthy not good whatever it might be and as a consequence then you know segueing into today's conversation is now good is evil and evil is good destroying your body destroying your mind is good because we're all doing it together yeah but building up and strengthening your mind strengthening your body living a disciplined life that's bad i i had uh we could bring it into the show but i um posted an article from uh, LA Times it's 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 not a letter to the editor it's actually from the uh, from the editors themselves and mm-hmm. so, but they they note it's an opinion but it says that um, that you sh- that that we have the right to an abortion at any time and you're like okay so they're saying right uh, thankfully they're using the language of rights which mm-hmm. obviously is fuzzy enough mm-hmm. um, but that that you should be able to murder any time right correct in the womb uh, in the womb yeah. I think is they're presuming I don't think they're saying outside the womb. Well. Yet. I mean, or Sa- Peter certain, Singer's been saying it for decades. Certain but, yeah. people, if they were killed, is okay. Well, yeah. And, and it's obviously, if you read the article, it's get, it gets wrapped up in Down syndrome, which is a common one, unfortunately. Yeah, eugenics. What will we do without it? Well, yeah. And it's in that also they, they note that um, there, there's a, well, there's a parallel article from a uh, Planned Parenthood people saying that they need, that they you know we're not going to be ashamed of our founder anymore. We right. actually just came out and said it. Yeah. Like, Ooh. Okay. Yeah. So you There's are eugenesis. Okay. Yeah. It's. I was reading this this morning too. Is I think we posted the article in Telegram, but um, about the demonic thing is. Oh yeah. If if a if a Nazi regime or a communist regime engages in eugenics, we condemn it as evil and satanic. <laughs> but when we do it in our own country, and it's in the pages of the New York Times as an opinion piece. Well, that's, right. we're just, it, we're just, we're just having a debate. We're just, it's just my opinion. It's like, I thought we agreed eugenics was just kind of evil. Like we just established that <laughs> eugenics is evil. Euthanasia is evil. Like it's just evil. It's morally evil, spiritually evil. We don't do it. No, we actually didn't agree. No, no, we didn't. No. <laughs> what we agreed was that those people over there that did it were evil. But when we do it, that's not, that's totally different. Yeah. Because the well, follow the different. Follow a deadline, right? What's his name? Data line? The guy who uh, exposed the Planned Parenthood baby sales in California, oh, right, yeah. and then yeah. uh, Kamala went after him. Yeah. Um, well, now he's been doing it in, in uh, Pennsylvania because Pitt University has been—they've mm-hmm. um, been like grafting embryo parts onto—I don't know—grafting stuff onto embryo parts. It's like mm-hmm. it's insane. It's just insane. Yeah. You're like, no, that's yeah. not communist China. That's here. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, that's we already know they're insane. In China, but. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. well, but it's it's a two way street. <laughs> I was gonna say. The, All right, there's no lock evil. on that door. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm gonna start recording. Record. All right, I'm good to go. And I'm gonna play some uh, war chant. L- louder, maybe. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band Books Podcast, episode number 202. One. One. And we are your intrepid hosts, Christopher Gillespie. Chillin' and Willin', Maxin, Relaxin'. And I am Donovan Riley. You know, I just thought about this, we haven't talked about it for a while, but uh, when people email or text us and talk about how they appreciate what we talk about on the show, but they understand why it's provocative or how it can be provocative, and it's like... Mm-hmm. Did the war chant at the beginning of the podcast not tip you off to the tone or the attitude of the show? <laughs> yeah. That, really, uh, like, we literally start the show one, off with a, with a war chant. <laughs> at least one of us is more aggressive. It's pretty aggressive. <laughs> well, I, that it, yeah, it, it, it's actually on my sweatshirt right now. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I can see it, yes. It says, aggressive gentleman. Aggressive gentleman on my shirt. But um, today, then, we're going to divide, divide back in. We're going to divide... Hello, welcome to the show. I'm Donovan Riley. I can't speak. Um, Simone Vile, we're going to go, it is Monday, and my allergies are just killing me today. So I'm not in the best of shape, neither is Gillespie. We both had weekends, we'll just leave it at that. Yes, weekends. We had weekends, God bless them. So we're on Simone Vile again, because, well, it's just fun to talk and, uh, well, read what she has to say and then talk about it. But we're back in Gravity and Grace by Simone Vile. We're going to continue with the topic of evil because, well, it's one of my favorite topics to discuss. 
<laughs> I was just thinking of a song, actually, and I got to remember who it is. It's We Are Evil. The song <laughs> Evil by Interpol? Oh, no, there's that one, too. Mm-hmm. Evil by Eartha Kitt. There is, um, I I think Nina up. Simone might have done a version of it. Yeah, maybe. Well, Nina I mean, Simone she obviously Death knew. Your microphone. Uh, she knew Evil. What's the the Hanging Tree, or what, what's the song about the tree? No, that's Billie Holiday, Strange Fruit. Oh, well, I think she did a cover. That's maybe why I'm confused. Hang Tree is an old folk song that became a blues song that became a rock song. Because I know the Hanging Tree from um, Queens of the Stone Age. <laughs> oh, that's did a right. version of it on Songs for the Deaf. And I forgot what's all about his name? that. He's one of my favorite singers, too. Came from Screaming Trees. Deep Voice sang with Lane Staley. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, right. What's his name? I can't remember. Mark Lanigan. Oh, right. But Mark Lanigan sings, what a voice. sings lead vocals yeah. on Hanging Tree. It's such a great song. And then Dave Roll plays drums on that album, too. Such a great it album. Does. That was that was what got me into uh, the whole stoner rock thing. Right? How could you not? That and then, album. And then you had the um, Them Crazy Vultures. Mm-hmm, right. With John bon- or uh, John Paul Jones and I mean, what a, The Boys. You know, there, there was that just brief moment where you had people, you know, like... Um, that were just connected backwards and forwards, I would say mm-hmm. musically, right? Yeah. They, they, End of the they, 90s, beginning of the 2000s. Right, and they were looking both directions. Uh, mm-hmm. White Stripes, what's his name? It'd be another example of this. Them Crooked Vultures, not crazy. Them Crooked Vultures. Yeah, yeah you had Jack vultures. White. Yeah, Jack then White. Then the Rock and Tours and the Dead Weather that he came out of. And right, and he went both directions. He had kind of yeah. that, you know, that classic, like, Roots kind mm-hmm. of stuff going on, but then also yeah. really went yeah. in some other directions. Mm-hmm. You know, just well, well versed musicians. I think that's what it is. Well read. Right. Am I you would say by literature? Metallica, Tom? That's a different. That's different. Well, okay, although that's a cover. Am I Evil is a cover from Diamond Head. I think maybe oh. a cover of Diamond Head. Wow, right. I'm going looking deep for, today. Looking for Dang. evil in my son. Da, 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 you've am got... I evil? Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm. See, I'm looking for songs, but I can't. Right. I have so so this is how you songs. date yourself musically is that you can say, well, when I first started playing guitar or bass guitar in a band, everybody had to know how to play um, early Metallica, Kill 'Em All stuff. Metal Militia, <laughs> Am I Evil, um, uh, what else? Basically everything off the first Metallica album, which credit to Dave Mustaine because he pretty much wrote all those songs. <laughs> oh, I know the song I was thinking of. It's from The Meat Purveyors, which mm. is a little bit Dang, tangential. Dude. Yeah. yeah, we kill evil. <laughs> it's a great song. That's what we're doing, right. though. That would be like our theme song. I like it. Don't we kill know? evil. Swedish rock for the win. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know when Speaking you can Swedish only rock for the win. Orbit culture. Greatest when you have metal sunshine for what like years. two months of the year, I mean, you're gonna your music's gonna get kind of dark. I think it does get dark. You want to talk about Seattle music being dark in the early '90s? <laughs> Go listen to Swedish death metal. Holy cow. <laughs> So I said to my coach, we listen to metalcore and deathcore in Muay Thai on Saturday mornings when we're sparring and because uh, it gets pretty intense. So you need music that's intense. But uh, mm-hmm. there's one song and I just turned to my coach. I'm like, I, is this music or is your boss calling you? Because like, 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 do you have a direct line to Satan through your phone? Because that's, that's dark, dude. That's it's super pretty dark. dark. Pretty dark. It's just yeah, a gag no, though, right? It's just a Fantastic. gag. Um... <laughs> Yeah, Scandinavian culture is interesting. I mean, you, 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 it's like uh, my professor said that the Reformation really never got traction in Scandinavia. It did amongst the loyalty, loyalty, mm-hmm. royalty. Sorry, amongst the royalty, yeah. it got traction, but amongst the common people, it never really took root. Which is why paganism in Scandinavia really kind of exploded the last twenty plus years. It's like as Christendom waned paganism came out and everyone's like where did this paganism come from like we've been actually been practicing it at home our whole like since generations yeah so it became a, it was this uh, reformation took off as a state religion but yes n- right. not in the folk religion mm-hmm. i guess is what we'd say yeah among the people and so there's roots of obviously there's deep roots of tribalism in the swedish metal scene um satanism as a reaction against christendom paganism which was there before christendom got there look if you eat fish that's been pickled in lye you got problems. Social. I mean, I understand it's yeah. it's it's what you got to do, but no, it's not, dude. There's ways. <laughs> There's other ways. Let's just let's but, be upfront. But I mean, seriously, if like if your if your diet is primarily things that um, right, 
you know, that you pickled or canned and or jarred or mm -hmm. you had to preserve with sure. lye. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying, I love pickled herring. I love it. But if you can eat a fish that's been rolled in lye, you don't need to get vaccinated for anything. You're good. <laughs> it's not evil, but you're, it is. Uh, it's it like is cockroach, something. Twinkie, you. <laughs> gonna last forever. Self preservative. <laughs> you're not gonna die, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't need lockdowns. We have so, lie. Yeah, we have we have lie coated fish. We don't need lockdowns. So as a consequence. <laughs> We're going to dive back into evil. This is page 72, I believe, or 70, mm -hmm. bottom of 71, last okay. paragraph on 71 that goes to 72, Gravity and Grace, Simone Weil. Let's get after it. So the sensitivity, sensitivity of the innocent victim who suffers is like a felt crime. True crime cannot be felt. The innocent victim who suffers knows the truth about his executioner. The executioner does not know it. The evil which the innocent victim feels in himself is in his executioner, but he is not sensible of the fact. The innocent victim can only know the evil in the form of suffering. That which is not felt by the criminal is his own crime. That which is not felt by the innocent victim is his own innocence. It is the innocent victim who can feel hell. So last, go back and listen to the last two episodes where we started talking about evil and, and reading this text. Yep, 200A, 200B. Okay. Because it feeds into this, because we're getting into Jesus in a second. And everything last week, I think I said at the very end of the second episode last week, it's all leading to Jesus. But she has to, it seems anyways, I'm just guessing, but mm -hmm. it seems like there's so much groundwork to lay to get to the Lamb of God. That's why this section's so long. She literally has to establish, this is good, this is evil, this is what I mean, because we talked about evil and good sometimes being the same thing. Well, isn't Calling good evil. What do they say, good. like, uh, uh, evil or good or evil? I don't know which statement it is. Is in the eye of the beholder, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is another way of saying that it, that it's highly relative or subjective. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know that that's actually true. I mean, we've talked about things that we think are objectively evil. And we, and mm -hmm. we think that because of, um, not because we necessarily feel it, although we feel it too, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe because it's defined as such in God's word. But I would even argue that it's inherently known in the human heart, you know, to go with Romans. Mm -hmm. I, like you see murder, you say that's wrong, right? Right. You just it's on a you know, and and sometimes well, there's well, evil we just, compounding we just talked evil. About eugenics, though. <laughs> yeah, we did talk about eugenics. But I think about like the George Floyd thing. Not to, to get a little contemporary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know where is you know was the was it proper restraint that was done to him according <clears throat> to the manual? Yeah, it actually was. All right. I, I mean that's been the testimony in, in the court anyway. That the guy didn't do anything. The cop didn't do anything wrong, and yet. Mm -hmm. Um, the guy died, right? Mm -hmm. So that's evil too. <laughs> right. Now, granted, what he was doing was also evil, right? Being mm -hmm. highly um, uh, affected by controlled substances. And, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Right. So, so there's evil compounding evil, and it's like, well, could anybody have done good in that situation? What would have been the good thing to do? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know that there was a good result possible. I mean, to preserve mm -hmm. his life would have been good, but it, was mm -hmm. that even possible? He was already, he was already, you know by any definition, in overdose territory. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> it's, I, 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 what was he supposed to do? Mm -hmm. You watch the body cam footage. It's like, mm -hmm. as a jury then, you're supposed to say, that's evil, that needs to be punished. Mm -hmm. right? There must be justice for, for the evil that was committed. Mm -hmm. And they look at it and like... Wh what is justice then? What, where, where, was, where, where, where was it even possible to have justice in this scenario? Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to get to that too. It's coming up in the reading. Hmm. But to go back to last week, just to, to yep. summarize, the difference between good and evil, according to Vile, is that good is inviolate. And only oh, yeah, that's degraded right. good can that. be violated. So therefore, when you call something good that can be violated by evil, it was never good to begin with. It's only hmm. good if it cannot be violated by evil. If evil cannot touch it, then it's good. In fact, as she argues, good is the rejection of evil. Evil doesn't reject good. Evil tries to consume good, swallow it up within the evil. But good rejects evil because it can't be violated by it. All right. And remember, so evil is unlimited, but it's not infinite. Good is infinite. Evil is just unlimited. So, I mean, maybe the police motto... Or limitless, she calls it. 
whether whether or not it's an accurate representation of what they mm-hmm. actually do isn't the point, but to serve and protect. That's that's an unequivocal good, to serve mm-hmm. and protect. Right. Right. But, and it can't be overcome by even the worst cop, I would say. Mm-hmm. It's still objectively good. Mm-hmm. Is that a fair application? For the sake of the conversation, sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. But then again, it's like it's it's yeah. exercised by evil people, right? That's or the people problem, who are at least corrupted by evil. If you and I can be violated by evil, then we mm-hmm. are not good. Period. That's why we were talking earlier before we hit record about intent. You know your intent when you do something, whether what you're doing is selfish or selfless. Sure. You know that even if other people don't recognize it or call what you're doing good. But the very baseline that she's establishing here is that good is inviolate. Like evil cannot invade and corrupt what is good. That's the nature of good, which means the very fact that you and I can actually be corrupted by evil, we can be tempted towards evil and actually fall into evil, willingly fall into evil, calling it good in this case, inherently according to vile means it wasn't ever good to begin with. You were just trying to explain away or alibi away or justify evil by calling it good. There's that um, somewhat obtuse stay, saying that they actually even just translate away in some some translations. It's uh, Matthew 20, 15. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. It comes up in the lectionary in the summer. Oh, yeah. Um, is your eye evil because I am mm-hmm. good, Jesus yeah. says? English Standard translates it as, or do you begrudge my generosity? <laughs> mm, is that Kakon? <laughs> I got my Greek Bible here right Yeah, it's Kakon and, um, and uh, whatever. Greek. Is your eye evil because... Um, or is, is, yeah, is your eye evil because I am good? Hmm. That's how uh, New King James does it. That's the literal. Matthew and almost everybody said. says it's an idiom and they translate, they don't translate it faithfully. They just turn it into, yeah, Matthew yeah, well, 20, 15. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about that. Is it not lawful for me to do with what, what I will with my own? Or mm-hmm. is that, is my eye, is your eye evil because I am good? Justin Diego Agathos Amy. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah, it'd be something to, to kind of tease out when you get to it in the lectionary. But, but, I, it, but it's, I've kind of, I was like, why, why would you say begrudging generosity? Because that, nobody even knows what that means. I mean, mm-hmm. you know what generosity is, but begrudging. And like, yeah, no. Right, but his, Jesus' point is, it's an inherent good. What, mm-hmm. what the, I think it's in the context of a parable, right? Mm-hmm. It's in, what, what, what the master does in the parable is an, an inherently good. And it doesn't matter what you think about it. It's mm-hmm. going to be good no matter what. Yeah. But if you think it's bad, it's your eye that's the evil thing, not the thing itself. Well, we talk about this all the time in relation to creation because we'll say, well, God created it and called it good. Mm -hmm. But then we look at it and say, but but, but that's evil. It's like, (laughs) no, it's good because God said it's good. Not by virtue of the fact that this, to use, if God created this cup that I'm holding up in front of the camera, Hmm. if God created this cup and calls it good, but the cup in and of itself is not good. I like mine better. Mental well, health Mine's matters. a leftover from somebody who left my congregation and didn't take their cup with them. So I take this seriously every day. <laughs> Mental, Mental health? health matters. Mental health matters. It does. Oh, yeah. On the other side, in Fairfield County, 1,000 teens will consider suicide this month. Exclamation mark. Enjoy your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty optimistic cup. <laughs> Daily affirmations. <laughs> of death. <laughs> Drink your coffee. How's your, how's your breakfast? Did you enjoy that? Because there's people dying right now. Yeah, there's a thousand teens com- considering suicide in this county alone. Which isn't funny, by the way, but the cup is. Not at all. Not at all. But what ends the up cup happening is, is that we, at- we attribute good to something that doesn't deserve it or doesn't merit it, but then mm-hmm. we forget that it's God himself who is good in and of himself. So this is imputation. This is attribution. God That's makes true. something, and because he made it, he calls it good. Because I'm good, and I made it, ergo, as a consequence, it's good. You can't just take the cup in the absence of God's creative goodness and call the cup good, because apart from God, it's not. Right. And then conversely, I mean, you're, you're, de- you're deforming things when you call something good that God calls evil. Correct. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and vice versa, too. I mean, sometimes we're called, people think of something as evil that's inherently good, and, and we tell them. I mean, mm-hmm. you spend a lot of time on this. It's like, no, discipline is a good thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're like, no, it's not. It's an evil thing. It, it, it's oppressive. And it's like, no, it's actually freedom. God like, disciplines what? those whom he loves. Exactly. And it's not a bad, th- that's not evil. No, sometimes, sometimes it feels like it in the moment. Right. So it's, again, that's running with Jesus' statement. That's why mm-hmm. just keep it literal, right? It's like your eye is, is distorting the reality mm-hmm. of what this is. 
right. you know, and taking God at his word, I know that's kind of a circular logic argument, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, well, God said, God is true. And so we should listen mm-hmm. to him. Well, okay. Or we must listen to him even, but we do it all the time in our regular lives. We just don't, we don't pay attention to it though. Well, we with other, with other voices, right? Not yeah. just God, not just God's word. That's what word. I'm saying is like, you, you look at a family from the outside and, you know, it's like I tell people, you come by my house in, in July with all the windows open, and it sounds like there's some crazy Armenians living inside because it's just yelling and chaos. Armenians but, or Armenians? Yes, Armenians. <laughs> Menia, Armenia, as in the Armenian genocide. Yeah. And the people that make rugs, not Armenians as in the people that are heretics. So what, happens, what ends up happening then is you think to yourself, well, the, the people that live in that house, they're crazy. They're yelling, they're screaming, they're gearing on. They can't love each other. But then you come in and you're like, of course we love each other. That's why we're fighting. And they're like, but that doesn't make any sense because what I'm hearing and what I'm, you know, know what you're saying are two different things. And it's like, no, you don't understand. This is a part of love. And you, all of a sudden you create this kind of like circular logic. Or with, I just have a daughter that screams all the time. I do have a 14 year old and I am aware. <laughs> in fact, last week, to your point, I didn't even tell you about this. It's funny you brought this up. My daughter is yelling at me about how whenever she comes upstairs, we all start screaming at her. <laughs> <laughs> and none of That's us funny. had screamed at her, yelled at her, even raised our voices to her. <laughs> but then the more we pointed out that we were, we didn't yell at her at all, the louder she started screaming. <laughs> and then I had to be, get all dead. I'm like, I'm going to snatch the words out of your mouth if you keep screaming at me. And that's, that's your warning sign. That's nature's way of saying you need to stop doing that. <laughs> yep. Yep. Bring it down. Bring it down. Yeah. Relating to the question, so Paul asked this question, relating to the question of whether or not a thing is good because God approves of it, or if there's a higher good than God, which he is beholden to. Yes, God is not beholden to any higher good because God is the standard for what is good. Mm -hmm. And anything that is not God, theologically, is not good. Well, we talked about that, uh, maybe it wasn't just last week, even the week before. I mean, Mm -hmm. etymologically, the word good comes from God. Yes, right. Think you cannot define good apart from God. I mean, and, and we would say the true God. I mean, obviously mm-hmm. there's there's other gods or, or things that we call God mm-hmm. that aren't good because mm-hmm. they're not true, right? Right. Yeah. And therefore, the very act of calling something good apart from God is godless. Evil. Evil, yeah, exactly. So then, the sensitivity of the innocent victim who suffers. So innocent victim, someone who is... Had a, the crime is being perpetrated against this person. They're innocent of the crime. They don't participate in the crime. They're not complicit in the crime. Mm-hmm. They're just there. And they're suffering the action of the crime. The sensitivity of the innocent victim who suffers is like felt crime. And you ask, well, what, is tr- what does that mean? True crime, she writes, cannot be felt. The innocent victim who suffers knows the truth about his executioner. That he's an executioner. Mm -hmm. The executioner does not know that. (laughs) The evil which the innocent victim feels in himself is in his executioner. The executioner does not believe that what he is doing is morally evil because he serves the state. I'm just doing my job. I'm just doing my job. But he's not sensible of the fact that what he's doing is evil. Hmm. Because remember, innocent victim is being executed here. Correct. So the innocent victim can only know the evil in the form of suffering because the, the, the crime is being done to them. They suffer it passively. Mm-hmm. That which is not felt by the criminal is his own crime. The executioner, believing that he's doing something good, doing his job, does not actually feel his crime. That which is not felt by the innocent victim is his own innocence. It is the innocent victim who can feel hell then. Mm. The executioner There's, can't feel the can't feel because the executioner is a servant of hell. It's interesting how she keeps using the word feel, 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 right? Or at least mm-hmm. the translator does. Yeah. Um, whereas we would prefer, you know, uh, true and false, you know, objective, mm-hmm. you know, know and think that language. But here it's feel, but it but it is feel in in terms of not emotion, but rea- the, but uh, the experience. Yeah, experience of reality of reality. Yeah. I think that's what she means. Mm-hmm. Like, and yeah, to the reality feel... of the situation is, I'm an innocent victim, and I feel the I feel your crime in my body because you're literally about to just hang me or chop my head off or, or mm-hmm. electrocute me. Mm-hmm. Whereas you, the one pulling the lever, holding the axe, you know, your attitude is like, well, if your head's on the chopping block, you did something to get here. 
You so the one this. committing the evil doesn't know the evil. Correct. That's what she's saying. And that, yeah. I mean, that, that's actually kind of powerful because it's, mm -hmm. you're thinking about like our current setting and, and we've called many things evil mm -hmm. um, that are being done to and it done passively. And we call them mm -hmm. evil because they're done, being done passively to us and we're suffering Correct. under them. Mm -hmm. We have been, right? Or, or we're watching others suffer, mm -hmm. right? That we have, um, you know, that are our neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet we, we can't, we, I mean, I've struggled with this. I don't know about you just struggle with like, well, how can the, how can the, the, I don't know, pick Mr. Schwab, for example, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the Klaus. grand Klaus. Yes. You know, how can you, or, 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 uh, you know, Mr. Gates or somebody, you know, mm -hmm. how can they not know what they're doing is great evil. They don't know it. They, they think they're doing right. great good. They Correct. don't even know what they're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's Jesus from the cross. <laughs> yeah. They're, you're, right. you're killing well, me. I was going to say, it was really what you're talking about are the two thieves, the insurrectionists. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Yeah. Because the one feels his sin. The one feels, hey, you know what? I did what, what I did got me here. I deserve what I get. Whereas the other one's saying, mm -hmm. shut up, dude. Like, we don't deserve to be here. We need to get off this cross and this guy can save us. Or, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it depends on which. There's only, there's only one of the gospels actually talk about that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Between the, the thieves. Yeah. But, um, I mean, maybe it's just like, no, we deserve what we get and there's no hope. You know, kind of the Judas move too. Yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah, also speaking of feeling hell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That'd be Judas. Uh, so, not innocent uh, though. <laughs> no. Well, I think he no. thought he was doing the right thing, which is kind of a weird mm -hmm. I, I can't get my head around that. I mean, how can you mm -hmm. what what was the rationalization and justification? Oh, it's just about money, or Jesus has gotten a little off the rails. I mean But remember, none of them believed that he was the savior. All well, of them were afraid of him. Yeah, at least a divine mm. savior. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying is that now that we're doing this Bible study on fear on Sunday mornings and you go through this and you start parsing out the Greek words that are being used and realize the, the variety of, of words being used that are all translated in English as being afraid or fear, the disciples are constantly phobic of Jesus. Like whenever it says that they were afraid, it says pho it's phobic, it's phobia in Greek. That mm. They're phobically afraid of Jesus. The mm. whole time he's around them, every time he does something that they can't get their heads around, it says that they're stricken with phobia of him. So it's interesting that, that they yeah. follow him despite being afraid of right, him. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it does well, go to the point, I think, of why Judas betrays him and why Thomas doubts him, mm. why Peter corrects him, mm -hmm. and so forth and yeah. so on. Because yeah. they're afraid of him. They're constantly mm. in fear of him. Well, they're trying to put him, keep him in the pen, you know, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Constra constrain the wild Jesus. Exactly. So now this we get to the nut of the argument. The sin which we have in us emerges from us and spreads outside ourselves, setting up a contagion of sin. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I picked up a book. This reminds me of a book that I picked up and I've been a reading. Book. I have a book. Yeah, oh, I'll have to make myself bigger here so you can see it. Uh, Gad Sad's The Parasitic Mind. How nice. infectious ideas are in killing common sense. Nice. He calls them. He calls them thought. Um, uh, thought. Uh, thought uh, contagions. Mm -hmm. I think. Idea Everybody pathogens. Idea yeah. pathogens. Right. And they are infecting. Mm -hmm. And they. And then they just sweep through and they destroy uh, reality. No, I mean he's a. He's an atheistic Jew, <laughs> Jewish by uh, whatever. Yeah. And he's he's quite sympathetic um, to the idea that uh, reason and that capacity. Um, uh, it's not maybe not God given. I mean, but but at mm -hmm. least it's inherent to us, and but we mm -hmm. can actually destroy it. Right. Destroy the gift that we've been given. So isn't that that seems like it's our hobby is to destroy reason. Right, and that I mean, what's what is sin? Sin is lying about ourselves, lying about what God has said. Um, you curb lying yourself, about selfishness, self centeredness. Right. I do and disagree it, it, though with the modern move to make everything about rationalism and being rational. I think that's oversold. Right. Well, and even somebody like Jordan Peterson has really pulled back from that as he, well, I think as he's actually had to suffer, mm -hmm. he's been given to suffer, you know, bodily. I mean, yeah. you know, terrible what he went through. Mm -hmm. um, some of it self-inflicted, of course. Of course. And uh, yeah. And, uh, and he's come out of it different mm -hmm. as far as, I think he was always sympathetic to the idea that there's a, there's um, a higher order of things that are, are outside of our grasp and we're mm -hmm. just trying to grasp them. You know, a spiritualism, mm -hmm. I guess, is what we call mm -hmm. it. 
Uh, but it seems to be more profound now. Yeah. But the it, but, sin which we have in us emerges from us and spreads outside ourselves, setting up a contagion of sin. Huh. I've thought about this uh, at a congregational level, not to be too particular. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it is interesting. If like one person does it um, and it's allowed, yeah. right? Yeah. Then others are like, well, then it must be okay. Right. right. Like, no, it's inherently wrong and you know that. Right. Just because that person's doing it or even getting away with it yeah. doesn't mean it's right. Right, exactly. You know, no, it's, it's very easy in the present context to understand how sin spreads like a contagion because, <laughs> well, false contagion. Oh, speaking of, <laughs> speaking of which, okay, so when you do a congregational self-study, I know this is inside baseball, but I mm -hmm. think it'll apply. I think everybody will understand it. Yeah. Um, you're, you're so, there's a congregational self-study, like if you're going to call somebody or whatever. Right. If you want to yep. get money, I think you have to do this too. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, you go through and it asks all these questions. And one of them is, is your congregation infectious? And uh, so then at least one of our districts has said, we really need to change that question now because it has a different con connotation it does, than it yes. used to. Yes. Are you inf infectious? I think they mean like people come and they're like, oh, I want to be a part of this. But it's mm. like, no, 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 no. Let's mm -hmm. not talk about infections and contagions. <laughs> no, no. Fear the germs. <laughs> Fear, Fear the germ. Them. So mm. thus, when we are in a temper, those around us grow angry. Or again, from superior to inferior, anger produces fear. But at the contact of a perfectly pure being, there is a transmutation. And the sin becomes suffering. Hmm. Such is the function of the just servant of Isaiah, of the Lamb of God. Isaiah 52, 53. Yep. Such is redemptive suffering. All the criminal violence of the Roman Empire ran up against Christ, and in him it became pure suffering. Evil beings, on the other hand, transform simple suffering, sickness, for example, into sin. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Ooh. So we make everything, you know, pure evil, mm -hmm. even when, you know, what was the... Oh, I was talking to somebody about coffee. This would be mm -hmm. good, because people like coffee, right? They're like, I want, they I want better. a coffee, I want a coffee that's less acidic, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 I always, I know how to drill down on this now. And say, so, um, you mean that you have less of an acid response, You're right? Because it's just like fat, right? There's mm -hmm. there's um, there's fat in your food, and then there's body fat, and they're not the same thing. <laughs> it's not like fat yes. turns into body fat, right? Yes. No, I mean, you can live off of fat and and be quite thin. It's actually possible, right? Mm -hmm. Ketogenic. Yeah. So. Um, so anyway, I say, so you don't want, you want less of an acid response. And like, yeah, no, that's actually what I mean. Okay. So what I mean, then what you want then is you don't want a coffee that has less acid. You want a coffee that causes your body to produce less acid. Correct. What causes your body to produce the acid? It's the to it's, it's actually a toxic response. Mm -hmm. Like to what? Oh, to the carbon. Oh, you mean, so you actually, you think you want a dark roast because it's less acidic, the cup, mm -hmm. in the cup. Yeah. But it actually counterintuitively produces more of an acid response in your body. You actually oh, okay. want one that's less burnt. Yeah. Because it's the burnt. So so the point is, is that, you know, is your body's acid response, is that is that evil or is that bad? Mm, well, yeah, in one sense, because it's responding to the toxin that you've put in it. But mm -hmm. in another sense, it's what your body needs to do in order to to take care of it, or at least to let right. you know, hey, right. don't eat that again or drink that right. again. Yep. So is that evil? No, it's actually, you know, it's it ends up being a good thing. Right. If you listen to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you, there you go. That's the key though. Evil, right. on the other hand, transforms simple suffering into sin, which goes back to my friend Freddie, who mm. noted that slave morality yep. and the morality of the common herd is such that their entire purpose in life is to escape and flee suffering and struggle for the sake of pleasures and satisfying your cravings. Oh, and therefore, so fleeing, fleeing mm -hmm. suffering because that's not good. Correct. For the things that are good, which are actually not good. Right. It's so suffering out. and pain are bad, and anything mm -hmm. that anything and anyone that causes suffering and pain is bad and evil and not virtuous. Anything or anyone that promotes pleasure and satisfies the cravings of my heart is good and virtuous. Hmm. That that does explain kind of the common response to um, to law being mm -hmm. preached lawfully. You know. Mm -hmm. Even regardless of the of whether the gospel is prominent or not, right? 
It's right. like, no, it's like, no, you just caused me pain. Right. Because you, know, you exposed something I didn't yeah. want to believe about myself. Right. You know? This goes back to what you were saying earlier about Goggins and, and so forth before we hit record is that mm, yeah. when you not only accept pain and suffering as normal, as a part of life, but also then actually use it as fuel, then all of a sudden you become so alien to that group of people that abide by that slave morality of, well, the whole purpose of life is to escape pain and suffering. So this right, person is right. actually choosing to suffer and go through pain on purpose and actually seems to celebrate it, which makes them doubly evil. Yeah, clearly there's something wrong with you. Which then coming back is you are in and of yourself a contagion because you're mm. infecting other people with this crazy idea that pain and suffering is good. <laughs> or if you refute that, you're infecting other people with the crazy idea that pain and yes. suffering isn't good, right. that it can't be used for good, or it is. Right. It, it, yeah, that's it, Nietzsche's famous statement is that pain is inevitable, but suffering is a choice. Hmm. You choose how you suffer. In fact, um, man, whether you receive meaning, it as suffering, is that what you, is that what it kind of means? Yes, it's like uh, man search for meaning. In that, in the death camps, in the concentration camps, depending on your mindset, even though your body was being, you know, um, forced through this great affliction and struggle, if mentally you choose not to suffer it, you were able to endure it, hmm. and therefore you didn't succumb to it. And the people that couldn't switch that mindset over were the ones who succumbed to the beatings and the torture and the starvation and deprivation first. They were the ones to succumb to it first. And so you know, what you do is you accept that pain is inevitable, life is pain, and therefore I'm going to suffer pain my whole life. It's going to come in different ways. It's going to be acute, but less acute. This person, you know, hits me with a rubber hose. That's acute pain. But then over here, I stub my toe, trying to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. That's not as acute. Over here, I suffer heartbreak because I broke up with my girlfriend and my boyfriend, all this kind of stuff. Right. But you choose how you're going to suffer hmm. that pain. Do you just say, oh, yeah, it is what it is, and you move on with life? Or do you allow it now all of a sudden to start to define the way that you see the whole world and see yourself and your relationships with other people? Right. To the extent that it pretty much paralyzes you. We covered Frankel um, episode 109 and 110, so mm -hmm. about half, well, half a year or whenever that was, a half long a time lifetime. ago, yeah. half a lifetime ago. Um, we did two episodes on it. I've, I've been seeing it get more traction, you know, quotables being put on social. Hmm. Um, people are recognizing that. I think what the, this book is actually applicable, particularly to um, what we've seen, is, which is really not the rise of socialism or communism, but particularly fascism in our country, right? Mm -hmm. where, where every... Every vector of um, of society is being are working together towards mm -hmm. a common aim, but which mm -hmm. is opposed to um, human flourishing, <laughs> largely. Yes. Yeah, um, and, and of course faith. So you're like, oh, he has something to say to that. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. It's interesting to your point that this is now you and I have lived long enough to actually see an anti-humanist movement become a global ethic and mainstreamed. And mainstream, that's what I mean, is like, this is the most anti-human ethic I've ever experienced in my life, writ large. I mean, I've seen it in extreme pockets before, right. but not socially acceptable, not actually become a part of pop culture. Like fascism is a part of pop culture now, and people, that's why people don't recognize it. Well, it's just, and the way that, um, you know, I even have family and friends that will, will defend it, will say, you know... No, it's a good thing that the media are working with the government and the right. intelligence agencies. And, right. Well, and, medical uh, segregation, bioapartheid is a good thing, for example. Like the right. number of people that I that say to me, like, I'm, I think that's a good thing. And you're like, wait, what? Like, didn't you grow up in the 50s and 60s during segregation? Did you learn nothing? Well, this is different, Pastor. No, it's not. Segregation is segregation. Health, it's, it's my health. Yes, concerned. it's my health. Oh, that's different. I get it. Yeah, okay. Well, it's selfish. Right. Since it's not a racial thing. <laughs> but I'm like, if you go back 100 years, women sat on one side of the congregation and men sat on the other side. Mm -hmm. They were segregated according to gender. And then I mean, I appreciate that and that, you know, I don't want to deal with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. That's why, that's why I work at the front. <laughs> I did. I laughed because I was going to bring that up and I'm like, eh, I won't bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I went there. <laughs> you went there for me. <laughs> no, it's like a hundred percent that, you know, that's why men came to that conclusion. Like women definitely need to sit to the right with the kids and then we'll sit on the left. It would have been lopsided, you know? I yes. 
I think they sent the older kids up into the balcony. Too. Although maybe this is more indicative of, of our church body, but last week in Bible study, a woman brought up that there are still congregations within our church body that don't allow women to vote in church. They don't have women's suffrage in churches. Yeah. But, but she was celebrating the fact because it forces men to actually have to come to church and be a part of the church. <laughs> mm, it's true. Whereas in, in churches where women do have the vote, as you know from experience and I do, most voter meetings are predominantly women. Right. Because the men don't, yeah. Because the men don't, don't show up. Yeah, they just don't, don't show up. Because they're I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But I mean, in the end, it's just like, well, covenant, the congregation's governance. Mm -hmm. Like, do what you want to do. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. I could care less either way. But if you want all men voting, that's fine. If you want, mm -hmm. if they want to let the women on the show. I mean, right. it's not fun, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Well, it just goes to the point that we've allowed men to not show up for so long and actually encourage men to not show up and be men for so long that we don't even think about that anymore. What, that, well, that, that there's even such a thing as, as a distinction between male and female, even well, in the church? Well, that too, but just that men are sp actually held to a standard of manhood, and that's a part of it. Oh, I did this I did this in class last week with the kids in the school, mm -hmm. and I, I keep waiting to, for the other shoe to drop where I said, you know, it's the responsibility of your dads to teach you the faith. And they're like, my yeah. dad doesn't even know where the Bible is. I'm like, Correct. well, and you need to tell him. Then he ain't a man. Yeah, and you tell him. And they're like, right. what? I'm like, no, you can tell him. This, this right. is what the Bible says. He says, it says, you're supposed to teach me the faith. Correct. It's not the pastor's job. It's your job. Correct. The pastor can help, but it's your mm -hmm. job. Right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, I think he'll get mad at me. I'm like, Yeah, I tried what? that last fall. That lasted three months. Oh, well, actually forcing it as a pastor? I mean, I can't. I just like, I just want the kids to go home and say something like that to, the, to dad mm -hmm. and then have him come yell at me. No, we I did can that talk. for three months last fall. I'm like, the parents are going to do the catechization at home, and then we'll meet once a month. To, oh, no, to I don't give up the catech catechization because I know it's not going to happen. Well, um, not for a while, if, any, if ever. There was a very strong pushback from the fathers. Really? That I do it, yeah. And then they don't understand why I don't respect them. So there's different ways to go about it, and, and no matter how you go, you find out that, yeah, no, the men aren't By men. the way, you can okay. love someone but you, without respecting them. It's possible, actually. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. <laughs> Well, if it's not true, uh, there wouldn't be any love. That too, yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there wouldn't be very many pastors, which, by the way, why they're female pastors, because men were emasculated and gave up their role as men, and therefore women could actually take, play the part of men better than most men, so we started ordaining women. So in the church, the women wear the pants. Okay. Correct. That's you an know expression. It's it. not it's an... literal. Yeah, but yeah, okay. Well, it is. <laughs> it's literal too. Okay. <laughs> and the women pants too. But the point is, yeah, when the men stopped being men and stopped behaving like men, women took up the slack and took over, and it didn't stop at just the voters' meeting. It, that's how we got women's ordination. Speaking of thought contagions, mm -hmm. idea contagions, pathogens. Mm -hmm. So then it follows, perhaps, she continues, that redemptive suffering has to have a social origin. It has to be injustice, violence on the part of human beings. So we're saved by our violence, or our mm -hmm. violence brings about our salvation. Uh, that's what Jesus says. Huh. The violent bear it away. It's the title of a Flannery O'Connor book. She got it from Matthew, right? I don't know. And the yeah. violent take it by force? Yeah. 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 Which is another one of those statements by Jesus that you look at and you're like, I, I have no idea what you're saying. I, I have no idea what you mean. <laughs> it's funny that we don't know what he's saying, and it's these statements about good and evil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oops. The violent take it by force. But if you think of, we talked, I think you and I talked about prayer. The piety. kingdom of heaven suffers violence, you know, from the days of yeah. John the Baptist till now. They take right? it by yeah. force. Matthew right. 11. Yeah, there it okay. is, Matthew 11. And you talk about the imprecatory Psalms. And you talk about, well, just the piety of the saints in the Old Testament and the fact that Jesus is not gentle or mm -hmm. safe or nice. And he and doesn't take it well when, like, you people distort. Mm -hmm. um, the things that he's given, you know, like yeah. the temple. <laughs> not a big fan. No. 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 This is not working for me. There's a lot of violence to our God that we just gloss over because it makes us uncomfortable. Well, like, for example, um, you know, a lot of people try to sidestep the whole violence in Canaan, right, with the conquest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, well, how dare God command that these people be destroyed? And you're like, right. you know, they're, they're complete 100% idolaters, right? Mm -hmm. And that's an offense to God. Right. And we're going to get to that. We're going to go read that Luther sermon and distinguish between faith and love as far as violence goes. 
because it's I think it's an important text and I can't stop thinking about it since you shared it with me hmm. because it resolves so many debates in the church. That was John 20, wasn't it? Or not 19? It was 19. 19. It's a passion it was one. volume 69. I yeah, think it is volume 69. Was. I wish they would get, I wanted the, the next volume that has chapter 21 because I wanted to find right. out what Luther said about the 153 well, and fish. So this is what ends up happening is that God does violence mm-hmm. and it, that violence is received as, it, so you suffer it. You suffer the violence of God. It's also but received, like, though, as evil, right? Right. Yeah. Like we were talking about. But then vice versa, God suffers violence redemptively. He suffers our violence, right. which, isn't, which is evil. Correct. Well, because it's done against God. Right. And he, but he then turns it for our good, mm-hmm. but, which, which is something only God can do, ultimately. Right. Redemptive suffering has to have a social origin. It has to be injustice. And has come from us. Violence on the part of human beings. Talking about Jesus, remember. So the false God changes suffering into violence. The true God changes violence into suffering. There you go. Yep. The great reversal, right? Right. All false gods are death gods. And therefore, their cult will be inherently violent. Well, okay, so it is, except it's, it's always about pleasure. Well, right, because that's the masochistic part of, of death cult, is that so they, we're trying to escape pain and suffering by doing violence to other people who are causing us pain and suffering. Right, so think about like uh, temple prostitution, you know, mm-hmm. with the pagan, pagan, all the, all the other religions, ultimately, mm-hmm. most of them, <laughs> if not all of yeah. them, right? And you're, doing, you're actually doing violence to another individual, yeah. even though they're maybe a willing participant, you know, because it pays or whatever. Um, mm. It's still violent, mm-hmm. and, but it's your pleasure Correct. Um, and it leads to death. Yeah. Think about uh, what was Luther talking about, um, you know, all the, um, well, the horrors of the papacy. And I can't remember which pope it was, right? With a thousand murdered babies in the, yeah. in the, um, in the lake outside the Vatican. Yep. Lives you know, of the popes, baby. Whether, I mean, whether that's a um, anecdotal story or not, I mean, it's, I think it's fairly believable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe not the number, nobody will know, but right. you know, just to keep, you know, putting those children, exposing those those babies born and just throwing them in the lake. Yeah. Because they, they show, um, well, their testimonies to the evil. Correct. And what uh, does evil do with it? Well, it can't create. It can only, what, what was the word? Perpetuate. Hmm. From the last episode, evil can't create. It's not God. It can't create of itself. Oh, that's so right. It can only per- preserve or destroy. That's what it was. Evil can only preserve what is or destroy what is. So it can only beget more evil yeah, and destroy that which is good. Mm-hmm. Well, no, she said it can't destroy what is good. No, it's, it destroys all that's falsely good. Mm. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Mm. So the false God changes suffering into violence. The true God changes violence into suffering. Expiatory suffering is the shock in return for the evil we have done. Mm. Redemptive suffering is the shadow of the pure good we desire. There's so much there. There is. That's why I just stopped talking. I started thinking about Jesus on the cross. Yeah. Expiatory is uh, having power or intended to make expiation, to atone. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right, so... So atoning sacrifice, atoning suffering. Right. Suffering for the sake of others' sins. Right, because even that that idea of atonement or expiation mm-hmm. is, I mean, that's a that's a word um, mm-hmm. that has a def- d- defined meaning from God. God says, "Here's yeah. what here's what must happen for sin right. to yeah. to to make if you like make amends, um, not yeah. before one another, but before God." Mm-hmm. Huh. You know, as a complete aside, I was talking about this on the Warrior Priest podcast last week a little bit, but you know, one of the things that I've been reading a lot lately is this Simone Vile stuff and. I think this, the way in which she writes and the way she essentially forces you to think and think deeply about these things and just think deeply about words that she chooses, it takes you somewhere and it's emotionally not a place that you want to spend a lot of time with. No. I, I, because, and I, and I, I see it as kind of, you know, like we were talking about with Jesus, mm-hmm. you know, reading her is also, it seems to me dangerous. Mm-hmm. You know, because it, because it is, it's not, it's not imprecise, um, but it is, it's so broad, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, like you said, it leads you in directions 
Uh, you know, each word can drive mm -hmm. you to to meditate upon the next yeah. word, or, or you know, or on yourself or this world mm -hmm. or Jesus, and and consequently, you're like, well, that might you might you know you might go afield, right? And that's mm -hmm. the problem with the mystics. We've talked about that, right? right. It's, it's fairly easy to get uh, like if you're reading, especially if you're not reading a non-Christian mystic. Mm -hmm. Um, I was listening to, as I was driving, and I was tired uh, on Saturday, what was I listening to? Oh, I was listening to our, our friend Alan Watts, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Speaking of somebody that's like, uh, he was talking about the Tao, and mm -hmm. uh, and I was trying to, he was drawing it to to uh, at least a reflection on um, the Christian truth as well. Yeah, no, I'm familiar with what you're talking about. I've heard it too. I've listened to that a couple uh, times. And you're like, mm -hmm. it's making me very uncomfortable. Um, yes, because he's very close to the truth. He's so close. He's so close. And he, and so that's of all people, dangerous. would know. Well, right. Well, he actually lived he in those contexts. He was an Episcopal contexts. priest, and then a Buddhist priest, then an Episcopal priest, then a Buddhist priest, also an alcoholic, also a womanizer. Mm -hmm. like, like we talked about, the greatest gospel preachers are usually the most jacked up people because they're desperate for the good news of Jesus Christ, so they preach it like a person who's desperate for a glass of water after Yeah, being and that's in the, the sense you get. That's right that he he's desperate mm -hmm. to find the truth. He is. And it, so yeah, everything that Alan Watts says is is one you're like he's this is self-justification. If you know his mm -hmm. biography, you're like he is desperately searching for an alibi. But because of that, he's also really close to the truth. Because he mm -hmm. won't stop until he gets it. In the, in maybe in a similar way to somebody like Aristotle or Nietzsche. Or Nietzsche, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Is like the people that I that appeal to me inherently, implicitly, are people that you go, oh, like this guy went far, and then I'm old enough now and seasoned enough that I recognize when I read that, like I read Simone Weil, and I'm like, she's going far. I need to go find out about her because she's definitely got a jacked up life. I guarantee, you, as soon as I find out her biography, it's going to be jacked up because because it's so self reflective. It's, yeah, it, it goes so deep and so far into such uncomfortable topics mm. that you're like, this person is looking for something, desperately looking for an alibi, a justification for something. Because normal people don't go this close to the truth. They don't dig this deep. Yeah, they just because live, you, can, you know, fat, dumb, and happy. On the surface, exactly. You stay on mm -hmm. the surface because it's safe. It's like mm -hmm. I talk about, it's like, a, it's like a bug skittering across the surface of the water on a glacial lake. And that bug will never be aware of the depths below the surface of the water. And it's happy with that. It's satisfied with that. That's most people. But to go mm. beneath the surface and to go to the depths, you have to be driven by something to want to go there because this is dangerous. Mm. And it's dangerous then to the people who read it, like you pointed out, because this can spiral out of control really fast. Well, it's like we talked about with law preaching. I mean, you mm -hmm. can you can go so well. We and I think we've made this remark that um, right. there are those who hear, you know, um, the law rightfully preached, and they never hear the gospel because they get yeah. so dragged down yeah. into it. And in this, it, ultimately, not distracted, but but in like a meditative way. I think it's consuming. Mm -hmm. wow. I really do. I was you know working on the book last week, and I got into a really uncomfortable section that I wasn't planning on going towards with suicide and prayer and stuff like that. And yeah. since the book's about demonic temptation, I finally got to a point where my friends have been warning me. They're like, you don't, don't spend a lot of time there because if you spend too much time in there, you're going to have trouble coming back out again because it's really heavy stuff that you're dealing with. Well, we've talked about that with like really dark movies. Yeah. You know, um, uh, what's the one, the Requiem for a Dream that I just don't I was just watch again. That one. Yep. The, the yeah. movie I've watched We're, one time. Because <laughs> obviously he gets really close really close yeah. yeah to it i mean in a way that you now you can i think i think you can even if you've never experienced it personally you can at least mm -hmm. be sympathetic to it you're like yeah. well i kind of feel like i did experience it watching this film <laughs> okay yeah it is it's like falling in slow motion when you watch that movie because mm -hmm. <laughs> you're like it can't and by like the middle of the movie you're like I, i've stopped saying it can't get worse now i'm sitting here with this dread yeah, because like, you know how much worse is it going to get? How much darker Tra is it going to get? Train spotting that way too, I think. It is. Well, the baby in the it's crib is kind of like, <laughs> like you're like, okay, anything beyond this point is not going to shock me. I mean, it's a little bit more lighthearted, a little bit, but <laughs> well, I mean, if you've watched Requiem for a Dream and you know the en not the ending ending, right, where mm -hmm, they kind of pan mm -hmm. up and you, they see he doesn't have his arm, but with Maid Marian going in the room with the men, mm -hmm. 
you're like, I can't, I can't do this ever again. I can never watch this again. Because there's not even anything pornographic about that scene. Mm-mm. But the way it's filmed and everything about it leading up to that, you're like, I can't, I can't do this again. I can't go back there. It's, it's evil. It's too evil. Well, and I, yeah, and we've talked about it with like Eyes Wide Shut is another one where mm. you're just, I understand it's a masterpiece in a lot of ways, you know, mm-hmm. artistically. Yeah. Um, but, the, but the subject matter, you're just like, right. it's mm-hmm. too close to, I mean, it almost, it, it's too close to the heart. I mean, I think that's really mm-hmm. what it comes down to. It's like right. revealing things that are in your heart that you didn't even right. know were there. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I did not want to know that <laughs> right. about myself yeah. or about mm-hmm. this world. Or, you know? Yeah, about this world in particular. Yeah. Or Kubrick's involvement in that world. Did you, oh, speaking of which, speaking of, and this is, talk about real evil, mm-hmm. um, there was a conference in Tulsa uh, over the weekend, hmm. and there were a lot of uh, these notable uh, speakers, you know, that have to do with, like, um, uh, election controversies, but mm-hmm. um, but also medical ones, right? Uh, so it kind of mm-hmm. got to all the freedom-related things, you know, does your vote mm-hmm. matter, you know, medical conscience, mm-hmm. um, but they, they premiered a trailer for uh, a movie done by... Uh, uh, Casaville, right? Is that his oh, name? Jim Caviezel. Caviezel. He, do, he yeah. did has another film coming out in the fall Correct. Um, on human trafficking. Yeah. And so um, he, he gave a little speech, or mm. a speech they interviewed him, and he did a Q&A, and he talked about his research. And he's like, yeah. no, I've been around these people who harvest yeah. harvest adrenaline from children. Adrenaline from. Yeah. And he, he names it. He's like, mm. I've been there. I've seen it. It's real. Yeah. It's not a thing. And you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, right. Back no, up, he's back in Hollywood, up. so he knows. Right. And you, but, um, well, those people don't have a long shelf life. No, but, but it's, but you can see it being normalized because you had the article right. in, mm-hmm. was it the Atlantic that talked about young blood? It was something yes, recently. And, uh, Silicon Valley harvesting blood from. Yeah. Yeah. Kids. It was in mainstream press. Yeah. 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 You're like, wait, I mean, right. like, I'm sure they get paid in, in the legitimate. Well, it's like, like, what was the, the, one of the headlines was, has, has Silicon Valley discovered the secret to eternal youth? And then the subheading was. Silicon Valley has been harvesting blood from young people who are participating in the vaccine trials. And you're like, Ooh. wait, what? Like, you're anyway, just publishing so he, that? So, I mean, it won't get a lot of press. And, and Jim obviously does not care anymore. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Because, no. yeah, we had that with the last film too, right? Mm-hmm. Um, when he was on making all the rounds and then he would just mm-hmm. always like, and Jesus Christ died for yeah. your sin. You're like, wait yeah. a minute. No, you're not supposed yeah. to say that. Jim, Jim, Jim. Pull back. You're promoting a movie this here. Is mainstream media, Jim. You can't talk about but, Jesus. Uh, yeah, so, you know, mm-hmm. it, it'll probably be, I think he's trying to expose the Good for great him. work that, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, I think they're largely, who, who generally runs our um, human trafficking um, investigations. Those are well, they shut the marshals, down, U.S. Marshal Service. Well, yeah, they shut down what they shut Trump, down most, a lot Trump of it, administration yeah. created. Yeah. Well, I know that was, which, which, was it, which of his kids was kind of the spearhead for that? Ivanka. It was Ivanka, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, talk about great evil. And now we have open borders and we have the, right. well, in, the in crime Ivanka's, families trafficking. In Ivanka's case, she was actually targeted by Epstein, specifically. Oh, that's Her part of the backstory. Her Paris Hilton talked about it, that they were both targeted by Epstein at Mar-a-Lago. Oh. In fact, uh, Paris Hilton talked in an interview last year that she was targeted by him at least, what, like a half a dozen, dozen times that he tried to hit her up to get her involved. That does like explain to, a lot, doesn't to it? To groom her, yeah. So it's like, yeah, if you've been groomed or you've been around that evil or touched that, exposed to it like a weasel. It's like I said to my friend yesterday, because um, a friend of mine said it to me, great reporters aren't given awards, they're assassinated by the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. And you're like, actually, that's 100% true. <laughs> that's an uncomfortable truth, Likewise, tourist, people yes. that expose dre- adrenochrome harvesting and uh, spirit cooking and all that, they don't, they don't stick around very long. Well, and we'd like to say that it's all just wacky conspiracy stuff, except it's not. You know, there's receipts. There's video. There's receipts. Yeah. Right, and we know. I mean, we know certain people involved who yes. are been quite open about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, we know this from some of the expose in Hollywood that that you know, there's like pay for play kind of stuff going on. Right. Right. Except it's not money <laughs> mm-hmm. that you pay with. You know, whether it was uh, what was the Me Too guy, um, the Hollywood guy Weinstein, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and people are like, oh, that's horrible evil. And you're like, that's not the worst of it. He's not even on the top rung. No, he's not even close. He's a middleman. Yeah. And talk about well, some of those child actors, right? They, they'll expose some of the, yeah. some of that, which is. Well, and I hear this a lot too. Know. It's the same thing with, with anything is that, well, yeah, that happened in the, that used to happen back in the old days. 
in Hollywood, hmm. but it doesn't happen anymore. Like all the young starlets at the studio were made to be prostitutes in brothels back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So that's how Marilyn Monroe got passed around Hollywood, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, they did that back in the, like women, young actresses don't go to Hollywood and get, and get pimped out as prostitutes to the movie studios anymore. They don't do that. And then like you said, then these actresses come out and they're like, no, hundred percent. That's exactly what happened to me. And it's that, well, we'll put it in the past where it's safe and then we'll condemn the past. Mm, okay. Except for the people we like, like Charlie Chaplin and Errol Flynn, who are pedophiles openly. Um, <laughs> And William Randolph Hearst and others. And you're like, well, again, that's in the past. And Charlie Chaplin's the tramp. And he had that great speech about Hitler and fascism. So we're going to give him a pass. And Errol Flynn was Robin Hood. And he was a swashbuckler. We'll give him a pass. But Stealing still from the bad. rich and giving it to the poor. Right. Right. Okay. And it's like, but there are heroes. That's the point. There are heroes. There are actually characters playing heroes. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we'll give them that's... a pass because it's in the past. Just like euthanasia, eugenics, the U.S. government experimenting on our, its own population. As long as it's in the past, we'll pretend it is in the Forced past. For sterilizing right? people in mental institutions and Down yeah, syndrome kind of people. Stuff. Okay, that kind yeah. Of stuff. Sure. We never did that. You just pick and choose. We're Operation. not capable of yeah, that. Whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's other people, but it's not us. And if it happened in the past, it was because those people in the past were evil, but people in the present tense would never do that. Because we're enlightened now. Correct. Exactly. That's one of the naive... That's, that's, the that's probably the progress. biggest... Yeah, that's the naivete of it. Yeah, I was going to say... Myth of progress. Who coined that phrase? That sounds familiar. I read it in Walt Wangren. Oh, okay. Well, the it's really Prometheus, of, or no, right? No, that was the myth of violence. The myth of progress. I don't know. There's so many. There's so many quotes here on. Uh, yeah. True. Good News Magazine even has one, <laughs> which is. Uh, it's one of our, it refers to the yeah. idea that the human condition will inevitably improve. 1932 English physician. This is why people don't like us because we have this such a, a low anthropology. Yeah, exactly. You know, but I but I think ultimately what you don't like is what the scriptures say is that you no know, no creation yeah. is not uh, improving; it's degrading. Right. You the know? good that I want uh, to do, I don't do; but the evil that I don't want to do, I continuously do. I don't right. understand my own actions. What, what do we call it? Not atrophy. Is that what it is? Atrophy. But well, like the that? sun's dying. The sun's dying. You that's mean empirical entropy? truth. Entropy, that's the word. Yeah, entropy. That's that's fundamental since since the fall in the garden. Mm -hmm. It's it's how things are, at least, right? Right. <laughs> right. You know, at least according to our tradition, that the religious tradition, that's what it is. Well, this is like, yeah. This is why we have to delude ourselves about evil and evil people in particular, like you said. Whether it's Klaus Schwab, who apparently is just obviously a Bond villain. I mean, how can you not listen to him talk and look at him and be like, With the hey, accent? how do you not yeah. have a, how do you not have a scar <laughs> running straight down your eye on one side? Oh, it would make um, it more epic anyway. It would. And then, yeah, like a guy like Bill Gates where you're like, well, he was inventing viruses in order to sell virus software for decades, and now he's invented a virus to sell virus software to people. Well, he even stole the uh, stole the yeah. original Microsoft technology. Exactly. That's, that's fine. Whatever. He's completely unethical, like uh, other people who run social media sites and well, created it, them. It was, yeah, okay. Who also and the stole CIA and, uh, da, da, and yeah, okay. DARPA and, 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 and. But as long as it happened in the past, it can't happen to us in the present. Because like you said, we're, we're progressed, we're evolved, we're different. We'd recognize it if it happened to us. It's like, dude, One you're of, literally a fascist. Well, we've talked about this, but the, the, the myth of progress is entirely caught up in mm -hmm. Marx and, and Hegel. But, yeah, it is. But they're getting it from, um, ultimately from the, from Hegel, right? Or I said Engels. I should have said Engels. I meant Hegel, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the whole he Hegelian dialectic is the myth of progress. Correct. Is it thesis, antithesis, we come to a better conclusion. Yeah, well, that's his whole, the, his ethic of history. If you read Hegel's history lectures, that's literally his his ideology or his ethic of history is the, mm. the whole myth of progress is a part of his historical lectures. Well, he it's wouldn't call it a myth. In our He'd call it reality. This is how. This is how. Right. This is yeah. where we're going. Well, no. it's August Comte, C O M T E, August Comte. Another name. I'm seeing century. that. I just found it too. We found it at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Um, he's really the one who popularized, I think, the myth of progress and called it. He's out. He's a contemporary of John Stuart Mill. Yeah. Who also a gr um, loved progressive philosophy. Yeah. And then I was forced by a heretic and in seminary to read all this stuff. So. At the very least, I, thanks, Gary. I kind of wish I did, since it's so foundational. Yeah, to, to at least the way. The butt. Well, yeah, because we're uh, unable. Well, we just don't know how to engage in this conversation. Yes, I suppose. Exactly. Which is why we don't recognize it. We can't call it out. 
And then there's Rawls, John Rawls. Yeah. Died in 2002. Yeah. 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 So, so I don't, I don't, I mean, there is, pro, there is progression, but I think, you know, in, from a Christian perspective, it's in the knowledge of sin. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, well, and and, and yeah. hopefully the knowledge of Christ too, in, in forgiveness. Well, it's, theologically, it's supposed to be progress down into creation, not up out of creation. Mm, okay. And therefore, what Jesus Christ does, what the absolution does, what the forgiveness of sins does, new life and salvation is, it plunges us down into creation so that we can actually enjoy being what God created us to be, which is creatures. And here's the other aspect of this. We were doing uh, Psalm 114 this morning, mm. um, and, it, and it, it has that kind of um, anthropocent, anthropomorphic um, mm -hmm. language for creation, you know, yeah. where, the, where the rivers are um, doing things, you know, talk. I mean, the, yeah. the, the hills yeah, the are... the waves are, praise the Lord and the hills sing in, the, for joy. Well, the hill, what was this one? The hills are, are, are leaping like the lambs. Sound of music? No. <laughs> no, the hills are leaping like lambs. I'm like, how does a hill leap? I can't, right. can't even get my head around this. Yeah. But but I think what the psalmist is doing, because it's frequent through the psalms and, mm -hmm. and also in the prophets, um, is to say that creation was, um, you know, is cooperative with, in, in the best sense, with man. Yeah. Right? It's there It's there to mm -hmm. do the same, some of the same things that we do. Right. So the hills, you know, do sing in a way, mm -hmm. right? You hear the you hear the trees whistling and it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a sound that... Well, Jesus actually uses it analog analogously to teach about the the movement of the spirit, right? You know, but but that it actually they are, it, it's there for um, it's there to complement us, mm -hmm. you know, in our proclamation, which is weird, just a weird thing. So you listen to a, a mountain stream, you know, you're mm -hmm. like, this is relaxing. It's it's yeah. it's beautiful. It has mm -hmm. you know has lines and, and contours that that are hard to even um, yeah. describe, but but that are inherent in, in, you know inherently confess something. And like, right. But there's no words, right? Which well, goes to the point then is that the good that we desire, mm, to her okay. point, the good that we desire then either leads us to Christ, that's the job of the law in one sense, is to lead us to Christ crucified. So we see redemptive suffering for what it is. Yep. We get a yeah, away from of us. Pure yeah. good. And we look at the cross and we say, well, this is a son of God. Or contrary to that, the, de the, the good that we desire drives us to greater and greater evil. Hmm. It's like I said yesterday in the sermon that our fear of germs has driven us to basically declare war on nature. Correct. Which is really a war on creation, which is therefore really a war on God, because you're basically saying that everything and everyone can kill me at any moment. So well, you're throwing their war against humanity as well. Right. That's what it is. And so what ends up happening then, we invent chemicals <laughs> to wage war against nature, against each other. We use chemical warfare against each other, and we just keep inventing more and more toxic chemicals. Well, and now we've had the greatest experiment ever as to the efficacy mm -hmm. of um, genetic uh, manipulation, yeah. which, you know, there was no other way to, to actually uh, get people to agree to a, a widespread clinical trial of yeah. rewriting DNA yeah. through, through messenger RNA. Correct. And now now that we've done it and we know kind of relat the relative risk, at least short term, right. and we'll find out long term probably at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, then we'll say things like, well, we could go and rewrite XYZ DNA, you know, for the purpose right. of um, some kind of genetic expression right. that, that we that we would prefer, right. you know, whether it's height or strength or, yep. you know, eye color, hair color, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. um, but but then also importing as the as the vaccines do. Sorry if you're a vaccine friend. Um, but, you know, there's both aborted fetal cells and also animal cells, you sure. know, in, the, in, in these vaccines. And they're importing it into the body. Why would we do that? Why would we take you know, a porcine cell, so a pig cell, pig DNA, and put that into your DNA in the cells. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't actually know why we're doing that um, exactly. Mm. Uh, well, no we one's find explaining out. either. Mm, well, you, you can go to the CDC site and read about, you know, everything that's in these vaccines. They don't tell you before you get shot up, but you can go look no. it up after the fact if no. you want. It's got electrolytes in it. It's got electrolytes. Oh, it's got elect electrolytes. <laughs> it's, like, it's Gatorade for your cells. No, I'm just saying it's idiocracy. Like, what are, you, what are you drinking that for? Well, it's got electrolytes in it. Well, what's an electrolyte? Well, it's it's in here. It's in this drink. I know. Oh, like the drink I had they? the other day. It's like, it's it's vitamin water, right? So it's got vitamins in it. And you look at it, and like, number two ingredient after water, thankfully, is... Uh, sugar. Uh, su sucralose. Su You're like, yeah, yeah sucralose. Mm -hmm. what's that? That's called sugar. Which is, yeah, it's called sugar. Call it what it is. It's sugar. It's mostly water and sugar. Fake sugar. It's not even real sugar. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I sent you that this morning, that video of the Pfizer exec that was caught saying that he hopes the virus never ends so that pharma can make um, profits forever. Oh, was that a video? I didn't watch the video. I saw yeah, it's a video. Just, so they basically, what Pfizer wants, to, what Pfizer hopes in this, in this video is 
We don't want a pandemic. We want an um, endemic where it's just there forever. That's what we're driving for is just, and then of course that CNN guy got busted on video mm-hmm. admitting that they've been lying about the numbers the whole time because it pumps up ratings. Yeah. Well, it's all good like, business, really. It is I'm, good business. I'm, it's terrible fascism humanity, is but good it's good for good business, business, apparently. For everybody involved, yeah, as long as you're involved. Promoting fascism is good for business. You do this, we'll do this, we'll do that. You set the policy, we'll set we'll set the tone, you know, right. in the media. These people are going to make the money. They'll get the mm-hmm. money back. The government will send them some money. They'll send money back to us. They'll buy advertising. Right. Everybody gets everybody gets wealthy except for the people. <laughs> so does that mean <laughs> that, that the, end, the end state of consumer capitalism is fascism? Or is it the people that occupy those offices that are inherently fascistic and are using consumer capitalism as the vehicle yeah. to push it? Well, I mean, this... Unfortunately, this gets into libertarian economics and... Because, I mean, really, I need you to buy my product so I can make a profit. But how can I force you to buy my product so that's the only product... Again, it's it's the old... Like, I need to drive all the small businesses out of business so that my business is the only one selling this product. Yeah. And then I'll get the well, most profits. Well, I mean, I don't think fascism... I don't think fascism... Fascism is inherently evil, but... Um, yeah. I don't think I don't think capitalism is inherently evil. You have a product, you want to sell it, and you you're going to make the best product, and you're going to make the best appeal for it. But we still the thing is, without we, without yeah. any kind of moral restraint, mm-hmm. correct? Then yeah. then you, you can use it for evil. It's greed. Capitalism is greed. Well, it's using greed as a motivator. That's what I'm saying, though. The 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 roots of capitalism is still greed, and greed that is unchecked, like she points out, it's just a social contagion. It just spreads. Well, you talk there's to no people. Boundaries. There's no moral I mean, boundaries. I've, I've heard this from missionaries, you know, who um, serve in third world and they come back and they're like, they don't, they laugh there. Like, we don't laugh. And you're like, mm-hmm. what, what do you mean? What, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, they, they, they have joy, yeah. but they don't have stuff. And you're like, yeah, exactly. Huh? huh. They don't have stuff. So where is our joy gone? Oh, <laughs> it's, it's been sucked away from us as in our love of money. Okay. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. Or stuff, I should say. Mammon, the our God. Love of stuff. So then redemptive suffering is the shadow of the pure good we desire. We want good, but we can't find it. So we invent systems and institutions and ideologies and false gods to try and get there. I love that. I love that paragraph. Yeah. Because she's got both kinds of suffering. Yeah. You know, and we talked about that when we were on Good Friday, where where there's that danger that we only talk of the expiatory suffering, the atoning suffering. You know, look at how terrible, look at the terrible thing that we did to Jesus. Right. No, that's a good point. Really good point. Which is true. Right, but mm-hmm. then, but there's there's redemptive suffering too. He's Correct. saving you, right? That's why uh, Luther says uh, to hold up a cross before your eye, before a person's eyes when they're dying on their deathbed. Yeah, like in uh, in the hymn, um, uh, "Abide with me," right? Hold yeah. thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Correct. Yeah. And so, yeah, in one sense, why are you holding it up? This is Jesus suffering for you. This is what for you your did. Sins. But also, and more importantly, in this moment, this is your redemption. And I think this that's is the, the resurrection. Yeah, you don't want to miss the redemptive um, nature of that or of yeah. that suffering. Yeah, this is why I don't think you can ever preach Good Friday without the conscious awareness of the resurrection. Like you can't preach one without the other. Right, which is why we are, are, advocate for the sacrament. Right, it's the body exactly. and blood given and yeah. shed for you for the forgiveness yeah. of sins for life and salvation. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's like I always whisper to people, I'm like, you know, he rose from the dead. We don't have to pretend quite so hard. <laughs> I like to create the uh, the uh, cognitive dissonance. So yeah. there's there's the rede- there's the risen Jesus next to the crucified Jesus, you know, or, yes, exactly. or above and below. That's, and yeah, like, I was gonna say that's our altar too. Hey, how the can it be? Well, it's not. By. Wow. I, just, I put a, I put a crucifix on the altar. Anyway, so now I. now you've got both. <laughs> you've got both, right? And you're seeing yep. like, well, which is it? Well, no, yeah. it's not. It's not an either or here. Right? No, it's it's pastors Jesus and the church is Jesus. Well, yeah, the, the altar is kind of pastor's workspace, so he gets to decorate. Well, I'm just saying, because we do, we have the, the statue of the resurrected Jesus with his hands out, like calm down, the calm down mm-hmm. Jesus hands. Touchdown Jesus. But, yeah. And then, oh, not quite uh, touchdown, a little bit lower. Yeah, a little bit lower, like calm down. Again, very upper Midwestern Lutheran Jesus. I, just, no, like, it's look at the wounds, down. Jesus. Look at the wounds. Yeah. And, uh, and then, yeah, like I put, because when I got here, there was not a single crucified Christ anywhere in my church. Couldn't find one. I had to order one and then Velcro it to another cross. Somebody found one in a closet over here at school. Well, there you go. That, well, that says everything you need to know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where it came from, and I don't know if they're going to hang it up somewhere. But they found it in a closet. You I think they're find probably a arguing physical confession of your faith, arguing whether they should keep it. <laughs> Some of our members listen and watch the the show, so uh, yeah, you can. 
if you're Shout in leadership, your members because my members are listening too. They can direct. You can direct um, <laughs> our, right. our direct teachers where you, comments too. <laughs> where you would like that that crucifix to be hung in the school. All right, right. go for it. So to continue, then a hurtful act is the transference to others of the degradation which we bear in ourselves. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That is why we are inclined to commit such acts as a way of deliverance. Make other people suffer, so yeah, make us feel scapegoat. better about ourselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So therefore, I'm going to do this, and I'm told that there's no guarantee that it's going to work. And therefore, anybody who brings it up, I'm going to actually, my guilt and fear, my shame is going to be put on their shoulders, and I'm going to make them carry it for me. Or at least insecurity. Yeah, or your insecurities, your fears, whatever it might be. You put it on somebody mm-hmm. else and then send them away with it. It's like she said, if you're angry, the people around you are going to grow angry because that anger pours out of you <laughs> as snide comments, physical threat, whatever it might be. And you're agitating people sin. around you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Likewise, if you do something hurtful, it's because there's something inside of you that's hurt. <laughs> it's like I teach my kids, bullies bully because they're bullied by somebody else and they're trying to get that off of them. That's my new favorite hashtag is confession by projection. Yeah. Yeah, transference. Yeah. <clears throat> and so a hurtful act is the transference to others of the degradation, which is in you. So we're so you just drag to everybody commit. else down. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As long yeah. as I don't drown. Or we'll all drown together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to keep piling people underneath me until I can get my head above water. You saw that picture? I posted it. It's from a Japanese anime that I I don't I'm not actually a fan of, but I saw somebody mm-hmm. post it and I hmm. really powerful. Um it's uh I forget the character's name. Once I tell the character, you probably know the anime. Mm-hmm. But um you know, um after uh, he keeps there's this vision of this heavenly city up in the mm-hmm. the sky and there's all the dead bodies behind him that he's he's been killing everyone until he so mm-hmm. he can pile them up to get there. I'm like, "Whoa, that's not a perfect analogy." So I don't not know what Pokémon. <laughs> it is not a Pokemon. No, it's, it's actually not, not an anime. And I even got it wrong because I don't know the difference, but it's manga. Mm. It's not anime. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> Somebody will explain to book. me. Anime would be the <laughs> animation. It's, it's manga. It's not okay. anime. Okay. Okay. So there we go. Now I know the difference too. I know. It's so horrible. I'll find it and then I'll, I'll share it in the video. All anyway. crime. All crime is a transference of the evil in him who acts to him who undergoes the result of the action. This mm. is true of unlawful love as well as murder. All crime is a transference of evil from the one who is evil to the one who is not. So by committing the evil on the other, I mean, it's not just committing, um, like making, doing something that would make you guilty, but it's actually transferring of shame too sometimes. Mm-hmm. You yeah. need to feel my shame. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the... Well, this goes back to pain and suffering. You yeah, escape that pain. Hmm. So I'll shame and, you and therefore I don't feel so bad. Just bring everybody down to your miserable it level. Circles us all the way back around to where we started with compl- uh, comparing. Comparing your pain to other people's pain, comparing your joy to other people's joy. Well, she kind of did that in the earlier in this work where she talks mm-hmm. about the Pharisee and publican, didn't she? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which yes. is what that story is about. Yes. So what happens then? All crime is a transference of the evil in him who acts, the one who's perpetrating evil, onto him who suffers it or undergoes the result of that action, which goes back to the expiatory redemptive suffering of Christ and the innocent victim who experiences hell. Hmm. Whereas the one who's the executioner does not, which would explain then why nobody recognized Jesus. Because he wasn't at all what they expected to find. Mm-hmm. And even even John the Baptist is like, this is the guy. Right. By the spirit, of course. Are but, you the guy? You know. <laughs> and then he's like, is he? Maybe he isn't. I'm not sure. I'm mm-hmm. in jail. Nobody wants to give John any doubt, which is really weird. It's like, why? Yeah. Why? Like, he couldn't doubt. I mean, he's suffering in prison. And right. now he's like, well, maybe this isn't the way it was going to go. Right. All right, so here it is. This next paragraph, I think, is illustrative of this whole point she's making because I'll give the example first and read it. I have friends who have worked in prisons. And. They did so because they wanted to be in law enforcement. They wanted to make a difference. They wanted to do good for the world. They thought that, you know, this is a way that they could do that. It's also, it pays well, you get good benefits. But then they had to quit because being a prison guard jacked them up so bad that they started to behave like the criminals that are around all day long. I've heard interviews too. So they take it home with them. And then their wife and their family suffers. Oh, there's the county sheriff again. Look at him driving around. This is his, you know, 
one of two a month. Past All right, so it's Griffith, over. and the manga is called Berserk. Oh, yeah, Berserk, Guts. <laughs> yeah. Then his final act is sacrificing all his comrades, climbing up over their corpses. He achieved mm -hmm. his dream, but doomed the world. Which is also an anime that they made. Based on Did they make it? Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. No, Berserk is super popular. Actually, it's been around for a long, long time. It's one of the OG uh -huh. animes. Well, there you go. But just yeah. look at it. I mean, it's just, what a horrifying vision. Mm-hmm. That's us. That's also Jesus, by the way. Except is, is he at the bottom of the pile? No, he'd be at the top because he's standing on all of our corpses to redeem them. Oh, like like the classic art with the with the um, this with is the skull. Know, he's leading the, the captives. The yeah, he's leading the captives in his train. The dead ones, yep. now risen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then, to the point then of the prison guards and and how it messes with you and in. Essentially, you develop the mentality because you're around criminals all day, so you have to think like a criminal to basically understand, okay, this is how they're trying to, you know, juke the system. This is how they're trying to hack the system. So just become a criminal with them. Then. You basically become like criminals. And depending on the level of security in the prison, whether it's, you know, minimum, medium security, even max, depending on what wing you're at in a maximum security prison, you become friends, friendly, with a lot of the convicts. Because you end up... You're there all them. the time every day. It's like it, when you're in high school and you're around people that you normally wouldn't be friends with, but because you're there with them every day, all day in your forced confinement, mm -hmm. you, you have to find something in common with these people. You have to get along to go along. Inadvertently, you end up having something in common with them. Correct. Which is why after high school, so many people that were friends in high school just never talked to each other again. Because <laughs> they had nothing. They actually had nothing in common apart from space. Correct. They were in the same physical space. Yep. So then Vile writes, the apparatus of penal justice has been so contaminated with evil after all the centuries during which it has, without any compensatory purification, been in contact with evil doers, that a condemnation is very often a transference of evil from the penal apparatus itself to the condemned man. Makes them worse? Yeah. Hmm. Going to prison, <clears throat> if you're not already a hardened criminal, will make you a hardened criminal. Because that's how you survive there. Correct. And I have friends who are long past their parole dates who will testify to the fact that when they went into prison, they may have been guilty of a crime, but then when they got out of prison, they were criminals. Mm. This is not encouraging. <laughs> mm. Well, you have the prison industrial complex, which is the fastest growing industry in the United States. I've seen people advocating for reopening mental institutions, but I could see that as having kind of a similar effect. Yeah. Like you go in kind of crazy, and then you're around crazy all the time and you you lose it. Plus they you, medicate you. <laughs> it, I was gonna say it messes with you. I worked in a nursing or you know, nursing homes, mentally handicapped facilities right out of college with all of my friends. Like we couldn't mm. find jobs, so we all went to work for um, to these companies that ran basically franchises of homes for high functioning mentally uh, handicapped people and some low functioning. But you spent five to six days a week eight to 12 hours a day around someone who's mentally handicapped or more than people that are mentally, you know, three, four, five people. And especially if of those three, four, five people, three of them are also, they act out in, and they become violent, physically violent and abusive. And yet you're around them all the time. Mm. And then you get back together with your friends and all your friends are around their clients all the time. And they're around the same environment. Your conversations change, your behavior I'm gonna, changes. I'm gonna say something kind of offensive to a lot mm -hmm. of my family. Go for it. Um, but yeah, you, elementary school teachers. Te they, treat everybody like they're eight? Uh, are they themselves become children. Yeah. Emotionally, they do for sure. Uh-huh. Because yeah. they, I mean, they have to in order to be able to communicate with these kids. Oh, no. I'm hyper aware of what you're talking about. Because you go to a function and you're talking with somebody and you're like, is she, is she condescending towards me? Are you an elementary? <laughs> oh, it's like our governor. That's right. Yes, my governor. Yeah. My governor is a, high what, was a school teacher. Yeah, and yours yes, was too. too. Yep. Yeah, no, um, <clears> but I was also I was also thinking of in terms of like, um, yeah, you uh, our catechesis and the struggles that that we have because we we want to be up here with these kids mm -hmm. and they're down here and yep. but if you go down there you stay down there. Correct. Right. So we 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 try to do this high level stuff and like mm -hmm. just come just keep pulling them up. I mean that's maturing ultimately. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that. I mean, I don't expect everybody to get there, you know, today yeah. or tonight or, you know, even in a decade, but, but like do it, right? 
because you, otherwise there there is you know you have just a low yeah. it's just a low standard but but it does affect you right i mean you end up becoming mm-hmm. um like a child as he teaches you children do. Hmm. Well, and here's the it, point of, of the paragraph where she writes, hardened criminals are the only people to whom the penal apparatus can do no harm. It does terrible harm to the innocent. Yeah. yeah. That's the point. Yeah. You go into it, you ain't walking, you're not walking out without something being changed about yourself. But the longer you're there, the more you become like the, the institution or uh, like mm-hmm. the apparatus, as she says. Do, do you think those in the apparatus know this? You know, like this kid may not be a criminal, but we're going to lock him up for six months, you know, for three months well, or whatever. There's been enough studies done and enough research done and enough psychological and psychiatric profiles done that all come to the same conclusions. Both people, people on both sides of the political ideolo- ideological aisle, by the way, mm-hmm. both conservatives and liberals have gone in and done studies and come up with the exact same conclusions. But because it's big business and there's a lot of money to be had. Why change it? I guess. You're I just thinking about the incarceration of people, not from them going again, you profit off of people being sick, not off of curing them. Oh, I suppose that's similar, isn't it? A patient cured is a customer lost. To a pharmaceutical company. A parolee who doesn't commit another crime and get in and doesn't engage in recidivism, doesn't become a victim of recidivism, is money that you're losing. And that's not cynical, that's just fact i've talked with people yeah. inside the penal system about but we, i mean we, about people have quit because of that but we've talked about it like uh in pastoral ministry too that mm-hmm. you know um people that create this kind of codependency on your past yeah. uh, on you as a pastor mm-hmm. you know it's not healthy <laughs> it's right. like you have god's word right. i'm here to help but that's well, it we talked about you know? this last week with the temptation of money if i have a oh, jail yeah. and there's 100 people in my jail and i get one dollar for every person that's in my jail and I, there's a spike in crime for whatever reason. And now all of a sudden, there's 500 people in my jail. And because of this, I'm getting subsidized. So now I'm, instead of getting a dollar for each person, I'm getting $5 for each person. Well, then my salary goes up. My benefits go up. Everything goes up for me personally. What's the downside? Yeah. But at the expense of people being incarcerated. So all of a sudden, it's like I was talking to somebody yesterday too. The more psychologists you have in a society, the more mental illness you have. The more lawyers you have in a society, the more laws you have, because they have to justify their their vocation. You're, you're, you're turning into an anarchist, not the violent kind. Turned into? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's too late for that, Jude. I've been an anarchist since 1998. Um, and the point being then is that the more laws and the more mental illnesses and the more prisons you build because of the consequence of more people are mentally ill or diagnosed to be mentally ill and more people are diagnosed as criminal because there's more laws that feeds into building more prisons and building more prisons is going to produce more criminals. You call that a vicious cycle. It is. And therefore, rather than look at the contamination, as she notes, of evil and how it affects the penal system, because it's big business, we simply say, well, if they're there, they deserve to be there. Uh, yeah, and she goes there in the next paragraph too. And I can argue from experience, both my family and prison ministry, a lot of people may deserve to be there because of the crime they committed and they're doing their mm-hmm. time. But I can tell you for a fact that most of the people that I meet in prison that are there and they're they're multiple, um, they, they're they're uh, they come they come more than one time. They visit multiple more than offenses. One time. Yeah, a repeat um, offender. Almost, yeah. almost across the board, these are people that have been abused and victimized by somebody else in their life. And there's been putting... evil transferred to them. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So when there's a transference of evil, the evil is not diminished, but increased in him from whom it proceeds. Oops. This is a phenomenon of multiplication. The same is true when the evil is transferred to things. Where then are we to put evil? Good question. Exactly. My grandpa's an abusive alcoholic. My dad's an abusive alcoholic. Therefore, I became an abusive alcoholic. And probably my grandpa's dad was an abusive alcoholic. It didn't start from nowhere. But at least four generations, right? At least I four mean. generations, exactly. <laughs> so the, the fact that I, I broke out of the cycle of addiction and abuse, it wasn't just, well, you need to break out of your cycle. You have to break an entire culture of abuse and addiction because you grow up in it. It's like I was explaining to confirman, my confirmation class. Everybody in my family on my dad's side is a criminal. They've all gone to jail or been arrested <laughs> multiple times. 
And that's rough. I, and I'm the black sheep of the family because I've never been in prison or in jail. I have been in the back of many police cars. <laughs> the point being, though, is... Charges were dropped. Yes. No, I just didn't appear for my court date. And thank goodness there's a statute of limitation on bench warrants. That's actually how I got out of that. I nice. just avoided being arrested for seven years. <laughs> um, but that was 20 plus years ago. So that's behind me now. Um, but the point is then when you grow up in that and it's normal for you, you don't think anything about perpetrating that kind of violence against another person. Hmm. Because that kind of violence is just normalized because you've grown up with it since the that moment you, don't you even, were born. You don't even think of it as violence. No. You think of other people as being not abnormal. Violent because they're telling you to stop. Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, we're going to go to the bar and have a couple of beers. I'm like, I don't even know what a couple. You mean like 10, 20 until we're out of money, until the bar closes? Like, what do you mean a couple of beers? Well, you know, like two or three. I'm like, I'm going to order three when I walk in the door. So I don't even know what you mean. Right. <clears throat> so you look at that and you're like, well, those people aren't normal because they don't know how to have a good time. And they're like, well, for us to have a good time does not end with us in jail at the end of the night because we did like a lot of property damage or human damage. Stories, yeah. And I'm just like, I, I, I don't, I honestly don't understand what you're talking about. And for those who have never grown up in that, that seems weird and abnormal because it is. But when you're inside of it so deeply and it's right. enculturated, it's perspective. It's like, again, if you say that vaccination segregation is good and you raise your children to believe that and they raise their children to believe that, but I'm over here raising my children to say no segregation under any circumstances is evil, you're not going to be able to see my kid's perspective. That's why that statement, like, you know, just walk it back. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easier said than done. Yeah. Much. Especially when you, when you have multiple generations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've talked about this, uh, you know, various right. forms of like, I don't know, maybe it's too strong to call them abuses, but um, just bad ideas in the church, you know, mm -hmm. or bad practices, you know, that just aren't helpful, or at least not helpful ones. Maybe they're not bad. Mm -hmm. They're just not helpful. Um, but to walk those back, you're like, can, we can just stop doing that. And they're like, no, you can't. We've been doing it forever. You're like, well, you haven't mm -hmm. been doing it forever. And even if you had, it doesn't, it's <clears throat> still objective, right? Just right. Do the objective measure. Yeah. Is it helping? No. Okay, then let's stop it. Let's cut it out. Right. Well, you and I... You and I both know that it takes two to three generations for a congregation to recover from pastoral abuse. Of course, yeah. Specifically sexual. Mm -hmm. um, it just, it destroys a congregation. It just rips it apart. And so that takes two to three generations. It takes three to four to five generations to recover from a catastrophic event in a family, a murder, um, a suicide. I have a, I have, we have a, a murder-suicide. So that's yeah, fine. Murders, yeah. And so if you think about it in terms of society then, how long did it take for the Germans, for example, to get over the whole Nazi thing <laughs> and, and, and basically become uh, fascistic again? Arguably, they didn't get over it. Arguably. I mean, they... they, they, they uh, Publicly, they were over it. It's not the Reichstag. That's the thing that burnt. What's the... Uh, the, the Bundestag, I think is what they call it. And, you know, they did all these nice things to try to make it more transparent. They actually right. did. They, they took out brick and put in, or stone and put in windows. <laughs> yeah, pretty. We prayed yeah. it up. But so you, we're giving the appearance this, of transparency. Right. But, you see this in countries now of, well, all of a sudden you have this authoritarian dictatorship or this fascistic dictatorship taking over the country. And you're like, but five generations, four generations ago, uh -huh. yeah. you guys, and then you're like, no, that was in the past. That's not what we're doing today. That was different. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why I've asked this question before. I'm like, what did we learn from the civil rights movement about Jim Crow laws and segregation? And the answer is apparently nothing. Because now we're calling doing stupid things Jim Crow that aren't, mm -hmm. even in, aren't even close to Jim Crow or Jim Eagle or whoever right. it is. Right. Which I but guess was this, We do this constantly. This is just, it, it, it just, you look at it from the perspective of a historian and it's like, ugh, why do we keep, why do we keep doing it? Because that's what um, we do. Mm hmm Over and over. Exactly. And over. Actually, I just got this point. Uh, a friend just sent this to me, is that the DFL in Minnesota has decided that my governor is not liberal enough, and therefore they're going to have a meeting to plan on how they're going to basically run against him and overthrow him because he's not liberal enough. He's not progressive <laughs> enough. And it's like, it's dude, funny. he's literally, he's openly a socialist. Like, he's proud of that. And you're like, yeah, he's not left enough. 
I mean, like how yeah, m- I was going to correct you. Yeah, not classical liberal, but uh, no, no, leftist. No. Like yeah. proudly, a, like a champagne socialist. Yeah, no, he's a leftist openly. And so you're like, uh, how how do we like how do you not recognize where this is leading? It's like because we're on the side of the angels. We're righteous. We're good, and we're doing good for the world. Therefore, you're evil for opposing us. When you said righteous and good, right? When we mm-hmm. talked about the etymology of good being yeah. God. That, that all that's demonstrating is that this is a religious ideology. Right. Right. They, they're calling it a social or a practical mm-hmm. or a political ideology, mm-hmm. but it's it is a religious one because mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what the data is, for example, right, <laughs> right, or or any of the previous um, attempts, you know, mm-hmm. at the at these sort of regimes. Right. Like, well, just because because I mean, well, it's utopian, right? So Mark mm-hmm. Marx had his idea, and he, we're going to get there, right? Yeah. Even though. Every attempt so far has failed. We'll get it right this We're time. We're going to have to break a few eggs to get there. And by eggs, and, I mean people. Well, we always do. Yeah, we all, you always have to do that. Mm-hmm. You have to step over some people. <laughs> well, the finally are dead. <laughs> realize your vision. In the gutter. Yeah. yeah, well, like Venezuela. And we supported that, by the way. Yes, we did. And now we're oh, opposed no. to it. Are we, are we for it? Are I can't we remember. We're not. I can't remember. Publicly against, privately for. It's kind of like Columbia in the 80s. Oh, we're yeah. totally against Colombia and what's going on down there. Meanwhile, we're flying just boatloads of, or just plane loads of cocaine into the United States. And by and we, guns. I mean the CIA. The, that direction, yeah. And George W. Bush and Bill Clinton. Oops. Just, yeah, plane loads of it. And, and so, yeah, on the news, oh, we war on drugs and blah, blah, blah. It's like I said in the sermon. I'm like, we had a war on drugs. How'd that turn out? We had a war on terror. How'd that turn out? Now we have a war on germs. How do you think that's going to turn out? And Good everyone point. just stares at you like, huh? What it's are you like, talking about? Yeah, what are you talking about? This is different. Is it? Is it really? We've tried to control germs before. It yeah. was like the kid, my kids said this in catechism. They're like, "Well, you know, like with the with the Black Death, they wore the mask, and that's and that protected them." And I'm like, <laughs> "It did not protect them. Who told you that? It was all mystical mumbo jumbo, like the Spanish flu. Oh, Wearing mastery in the Spanish flu, same thing, over and over. We just keep doing the same thing over and over again. We never learn." Because oh, there's I the think this is the progress. key point yes. then. Yeah, the yeah. reason this example fits for what we're talking is, mm-hmm. this is the question then. Where do we put the evil? Okay, let's answer it. That's the point though, right? Is that you, really what you're asking with the Black Death, the Spanish flu, you know, the um, My Sharona, Miley Cyrus is, <laughs> I just love that, from Viva Fry, the My Sharona, Miley Cyrus, um, is we have this evil now. Or whether it's real or not, doesn't matter. Hegelian mm-hmm. dialectic aside, whether it's real or, or, or um, uh, a photo op kind of evil, right? What do, where do we put it? And the answer is, well, don't keep saying that the things that we are doing don't help get rid of it. Give us something that we can hold on to, that we can really get our fingers around and right. grasp onto that is a solution to get this evil away from us. Which goes back to your point, right? Is that all crime is a transference of the evil in him who acts to the one who undergoes the result of the action. So to your point, right, you know, you have your Rockefellers, your Gateses, your Soroses, the evil in them is transferred onto our shoulders. And then we accept it because of that slave morality. They promise right. to relieve our suffering and our pain. And then well, turn around and go, well, technically to relieve your suffering and pain, I'm going to need to profit off of you every three months because... It turns out that this vaccine mm. isn't really a vaccine, and it doesn't really immunize you against anything. Or at least we're Just not like, sure if it does. Then why are we sure. doing it? Yeah, money. <laughs> if anything, it's money. Mm-hmm. That would that would be enough reason, but there might be others. They're psychopaths. <laughs> they want to reduce the world's population to 500 million people. I'm still waiting for ban- for YouTube to ban us. <laughs> I know, right? We must not say the right keywords. I just well, we don't have we're enough. trying really we hard people here. Follow us. Yeah, we <laughs> That's true. The, like li- li- their algorithm should be like a, just a siren going off twenty four seven when this podcast <laughs> goes up. So in this way, however, it would not take us long to sully our own point. Oh wait, did I skip a paragraph? Where mm-hmm, then are we did. to put evil? We have to transfer it from the impure part to the pure part of ourselves thus changing it into pure suffering. The crime which is latent in us, we must inflict upon ourselves. Masochistic, okay. Well, I don't know, I guess, but in a positive sense, in that you okay. recognize this is evil. This, this urge within me, this thought within me, this desire is evil. For example, 
according to the commandments, I love my wife, and therefore I'm not allowed to just wander freely loving women as, as I love my wife. That's called adultery. Now, if I recognize within myself the urge or the desire to commit adultery or to allow my heart to wander and to allow it to reside or give it, give my heart to another woman who's not my wife, I need to address that within myself and not try and transfer it onto somebody else, like my wife, mm-hmm. and right. blame my wife for my feelings and say, well, I wouldn't feel this way about this person if it wasn't for you, rather than recognize, no, the feelings that I have towards another person are indicative of something that's wrong inside of me, yeah. not well, my we wife. Know, we know people that are, are basically serial, adulterous, serial marriers, right? right? I yeah. mean, it just, yeah. it's back and they just keep going, going, going. And like, mm-hmm. you're never going to find what you're looking for here. Correct. <laughs> the song is yeah. right. Yeah. You're still not, you're still not found it because, yep. because ultimately, well, like with marriage, I mean, you marry your wife, you're, mm-hmm. you and you and your wife, you don't stay the same. You change right. physically and, you know, mm-hmm. attractive and all physically, that kind of thing, chemically and biologically, all that everything. stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, so the way that you come to love her today is different than the, than you did when you were younger. Thank God. Yeah. But then, but then you're like, well, but I want to be young again. Right. That whole mm-hmm. <laughs> young it, blood it, thing. Well, but Potent, virile. Attractive. Right. Well, good luck with that because mm-hmm. you know, just read the um, read the data about uh, um, about uh, sperm count, right? Mm-hmm. That too. Yeah. <laughs> and like everybody has changed in the last twenty years, mm-hmm. ten years. Mm-hmm. Why uh, nobody's diagnosing yet? Well, we have our suspicions, but there's been trials and tests. There's been things. I drank the Kool Aid, but citing my Cyrus is a <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, Mark. My Sharona, Miley Cyrus. You didn't, you didn't even spell Miley right. Come on. <laughs> I don't know how to spell Miley correctly, so Mark and I are on one side of this discussion. I almost I almost got into her again when she when she did the whole collaboration with uh, Flaming Lips, but then I lost interest in both Flaming Lips and Miley Cyrus. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> so, there you go. That's right. I did. I brought up my Sharona, Miley Cyrus. Is she still with uh, Liam? I think she's still Who? with Liam, isn't she? I don't. I don't. Hemsworth? Follow. I don't. I can't. Oh. I don't. I just see it pop up here and there. Bridge. Sure a we bridge know. too far. Instead of a bride too far, that's good. I like that. That's Either way. That's a corrective. That works. Either way it fits. <laughs> so then what? this is what we do though, right? Is that we recognize, okay, like you said earlier, it's inherent within us that we recognize the distinction between good and evil. Mm-hmm. We know by, you know, again, like I said, we know our intent when we do something. We know it. Right, right. Therefore, when you go, to use the example then, when you go searching for another, another uh, a replacement essentially for your spouse, you know why you're doing that. You know it in your heart why you're doing it. And no matter what you do to justify it, no matter who you surround yourself with, who's going to help you justify it, whether consciously or unconsciously, you know you're doing that. When you blame your spouse right. for your feelings or, or your wandering eye or heart, you know though, in your heart, you know the intent. That's why and, we say like flippantly, you know, reasons, because yeah. we're, what we're saying there is like they, they actually don't matter because they don't. They're, it, 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 I don't care what it's an alibi. Is. It's an alibi. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So then rather than allow that out, which then again is a contagion that infects others, it spreads sin, you repent toward the cross and recognize like, no. God will give me, has given me the strength. He has revealed to me the secrets of my own heart, the darkness and the depths of my own evil. And therefore, I pray for the strength to not perpetrate this evil on my wife, my husband, my neighbor, but rather turn it in on myself and use it Mm -hmm. to repent of this evil and say, okay, what about me drives me to this place? Because like I was explaining to Steve last night, you know, the reason that a lot of addicts relapse is because they don't address the root cause of their addiction. They think, well, I'll just stop using and I'll stop hanging out with my buddies. It's the alcohol's fault. Right. Right. It's my buddies. It's, it's everything, but what was the root cause of you seeking this out in the first place? Because yeah, maybe you don't hang out with your, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't go to the bar and hang out with your drinking buddies. I don't drink alcohol, but now I've developed a different addiction and a different group of drinking buddies, so to speak. And you just keep repeating the same addiction over and over again because you just won't address the root cause. But once you address the root cause and cut that off, you don't have to worry about drinking or using anymore because it's not even an option to you because you've eliminated the whole reason you sought it out in the first place. But right. until you right. get there, you're always at a risk for relapse. Likewise, 
if you commit adultery once or you let your heart wander one time, if you don't address the root cause of that, you're going to do it again. That's true. Which is why having a low anthropology is beneficial for your marriage. (laughs) We might just say it's just being realistic, yes. I would argue that because it leads you to repent, but it also leads you to ask for forgiveness. Hmm, just recognize this is going to be messy and mixed up, and we're going to have we're messed going to have... up. Or I don't know if you know this, but this has been going on in my heart lately, and I wanted to give voice to it, but I'm going to give voice to it because I want you to absolve me. Right. So therefore, I'm going to confess. Right. That's a good marriage. <laughs> yeah. In, in my opinion, you don't hide the evil; you expose the evil to the light. Hmm. So then she writes, the crime which is latent in us, we must inflict on ourselves instead of others. In this way, however, it would not take us long to sully our own point of inward purity if we did not renew it by contact with an unchangeable purity placed beyond all possible attack, Jesus. There you go. So then I highlighted this. Patience consists in not transforming suffering into crime. That in, it, in itself is enough to transform crime into suffering. Put it up on the screen. There it is. Yeah. This is why you suffer for the sake of the other person. Not because you're it's getting something out of it. It's not a crime to suffer. And it's not a crime to suffer for someone else. Correct. Huh. In fact, it's, it, it, to her point, it's kind of the foundation of how you don't commit crime and perpetrate that on other people. Well, and we would argue it's the, fu- you know, the foundation of the Christian life. Correct. Because you think about, like, even the second table of the law commandments mm-hmm. for us, four through ten, you know, from honoring your parents forth. Mm-hmm. I mean, it all requires you to suffer yourself because yeah. you don't want to. You don't want to listen to other authorities, especially yeah. your parents, right? You know, but but actually, God says this is good for you. The suffering, mm-hmm. right? Sacrificing your own will, your own desire mm-hmm. uh, to listen to the other who God has placed right. over you, you know, to govern you. Right. It's hard. That's why it's I, hard. I prefer anarchy because then I can suffer myself rather than the state. <laughs> well, if you know. Yeah, it, an, <laughs> anarchy requires you to be uh, to have a degree of self awareness. Yes, I would, yeah. Or it's, yeah. Otherwise, it's not successful. Well, it's just like you read Michael Malice's tweets, for example. <laughs> He's right. Like uh, most of the time, when I read his tweets, I'm like, "You are 100 percent correct." However, I'm not going to share this on social media because this is brutally true. Yeah. Well, he just doesn't care. No, he's brilliant. He's just he a does brilliant, not you know, care what you think just, about what he says. No, it's just fantastic. Because he's the kid who sat in the back of the classroom and made snide comments about the teacher and yeah. was 100% correct. And you knew that when he got kicked out of class, it's because he was right and the teacher was caught out. Did you, um, I, I think I sent it to you, the interview he had with, um, uh, oh, what's the show? I listened to it, The Libertarian Show. Ah, I can't remember. Woods, right? I can't remember his first name. Tom Woods. Mm. Tom Woods. And he, they have a whole conversation about this. He's like, um, Malice says, you know, look, I'm not for everybody. Mm-hmm. There's a certain personality type that can listen to me, and there's a lot of mm-hmm. people that can't. He said, but a lot of people will listen to you, Tom, because you're like the dad, the, mm-hmm. the professor. You yep. know, you lay things out. You're not yep. offensive. You know, you're just really straightforward. You know, and, and certain people will listen to you. They'll respect you, and they'll listen to you, right? So Malice recognizes, I'm not for everybody. Some people, it's exactly what they need to hear, right? Yeah. You know, uh, that, that more. And it, I, I liken it to, um, you know, like uh, Candace Owens is this way, too. You know, a lot of people are offended by Candace Owens. Mm. You're like, but uh, most of, well, many folks are offended in her own culture by her own kind of attitude, but she gains a lot of respect too. Because mm-hmm. they're like, this is how we talk. This is yeah. how we interact with each other. And right. yeah, some cultures are not going to respond well to this. Mm-hmm. I'm not for them. I'm for you. Right? Right. I'm for my people. Right. right? The people who, under, who, who are, yeah. we, we're in the same social circle. We you know, I often share the same skin color, et cetera. Right. So, right. And, and that's, I think that's okay. You can't be everything to everybody, despite what Paul said. Right. <laughs> you could try, but <laughs> good luck. Um, but you do suffer each other. I, that's, mm-hmm. I think this is really important, right? Mm-hmm. And, and to do it patiently. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, I actually thought of that this morning. I'm like, mm-hmm. I've, I've got people that I'm trying to interact with and the amount of patience it requires. Cause, Correct. Because we, it's like Malice and, and Tom Woods. It's like, I, I obviously don't communicate in a way that, that works for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, you and I do, but uh, you know this person I'm trying to interact with mm-hmm. is like it requires such patience to be like, no, I'm going to be persistent in in the way that I communicate and recognize that you may never come along with me on this. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, that doesn't mean you know that either of us are wrong well, necessarily, but yeah. I think what most people in our congregations don't appreciate, even though I say it mm-hmm. often enough, is I say about 10% of what I'm actually thinking. Ooh, yeah, isn't that the truth? So if you find what I say difficult, imagine if I just let loose and gave you 15 to 20%. You self-audit? What are you talking about? No, terribly. I was just explaining this to my friend Josh yesterday after church. Is like, there's a point in every sermon usually, towards the middle-ish part of every sermon, where I just leave my body. Like, I'm just gone. Like, I'm in the sermon, and I'm just, I'm in the flow state. And when I get there, I have to pull myself back in, because when I hit that point, I want to just start talking. But what's going to come out, I think you may alluded to it earlier about, you know, preaching the law, is like, mm-hmm. what's yeah. going to come out is rage. And it's rage against Satan and evil. It's rage at the, my frustrations at watching friends and colleagues and, and family members fall into sin and, and be mm-hmm. destroyed by it. It's rage towards myself and rage towards the world and rage towards everything that I don't have control over. So if I allow myself to get so wound up, ecstatic within the context of the sermon that all of a sudden now I just start, quote unquote, speaking from the heart, yeah. <laughs> I'm going brutal, to brutalize my congregation. Right, but and I it's think not, Dylan... and it's not going to lead to Christ. That's the the key point here. Is okay, it's, yeah. it's not going to lead you to the gospel. It's not. There's no for you. If right, I let that, go, there's no for you. That's where Dylan Thomas is helpful, right? Because it's rage, right. rage against the dying of the dying light. Dying of the light, exactly. Right. So, I mean, so that's where the rage has to be directed right. towards whatever offense and uh, the gospel. Also, I usually start talking like David Goggins. So, every, every literally every third word's an f bomb. A little salty, yes. A little salty, but it's recognizing. The reason I write a manuscript is to protect the congregation and mm-hmm. myself me from too. myself. Me too. So when people ask me that, they're like, well, you don't work off of a manuscript when you teach. I'm like, because when I teach, I'm riffing, I'm having a conversation with you. We're just, it, that's what it is, right? And we can disagree with each other and, and engage in debate healthily. Right. But when I'm in the pulpit, you're not talking. It would be no different gonna, if, yeah, yeah, if our culture allowed for that. For people to yell back at you, right? You know, when you're saying, yeah, as stuff. Steve said, Josh and, and Steve would still be sitting in their pew. Well, you'd probably be laying down in your pews in the fetal position if I kept talking. <laughs> but, but that's there's what I mean humility is, right there, or it's just maybe that's it's just narcissism. a fact, dude. It's just a fact. <laughs> like the evil that would pour out of me if I let go, um, and you would try and justify it. I would try and justify it, and I would alibi it because I'm. It's a what the people need to hear, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And that's a blatant lie. All I'm trying to do is transfer my evil onto you and make you carry it away from the church. So I can say, yep, see? But like I said, when you're in the pulpit, no one's going to stand up and, and point at you and be like, you need to stop, you're out of line, or this is wrong, or this isn't the gospel. In a Bible study type of situation, you can have that conversation because yeah. it's a conversation. Well, you often say, no, I need to walk this back, I need to clarify that. Right. Yeah, but in a sermon, this. you kind of got a captive audience. Mm-hmm. And therefore, In our tradition, anyway, yeah, yeah, and therefore, as a consequence, you can transform. Going back to what he says, or she says, a false god changes suffering into violence, whereas the true god changes violence into suffering. Meaning, mm-hmm. you've got to get to Jesus and the four units of the gospel. That violence has to has to lead to and, to Christ's and suffering. So, to come yeah. back around, then you have, I think, anyways, you have to recognize as a preacher in this instance, your job in the pulpit is not to unleash and speak from the heart, your job is to preach Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins, and to recognize that if there's comfort in the gospel, we first have to name what has caused you discomfort, evil, Mm -hmm. sin, Satan. Well, I think the wrath of God is going to be revealed whether we do it or not. Yes. Let's not be a contributing (laughs) factor to that, yes. Yeah, yeah. But this is what I mean, is that the, the sermon, for example, the pulpit is not the place for you to air your personal hobby horses, your grievances, your rage, your resentments. Whatever it might be, your questions of faith. Mm-hmm. Right. The pulpit's the place to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And yes, obviously we made it clear, blatantly clear on this podcast. You got to preach the law lawfully because you. What's the comfort of the gospel for? Right. But like the evil is exposed to the light. That's what. Correct. That's what we're going about. It's not right, just exactly. exposed and left dark. No. I said, well, there's that dark thing. I'm like, well, it's we'll good. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. No. No. Well, it's still dead and it's still killing mm-hmm. you. Right. Yeah. Until it's exposed you know, to the disinfectant, I suppose, which right. is the light. Well, that was the end of the sermon yesterday, was that there is no war. Jesus won. He yeah, won. what are you worried about? Yeah. We get the spoils of Jesus' defeat of sin and death and Satan is the fact that we get to live in, in freedom from fear of germs. 
Yeah. And here's the congregation gathered around Christ's gifts. Correct. Like, what more do you want? I mean, this right. is as close to heaven. Well, this is heaven. <laughs> right. So, exactly. Like, I mean, yeah, we're surrounded by hell. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. But here's heaven. Christ, right. Christ's kingdom has come. So, <laughs> right. Well, yeah, here's the great. And so, to my point, then, here's the problem with if I just start speaking from the heart, let that rage out. To transfer evil to what is exterior, meaning in this case, my congregation, uh-huh. is to distort the relationship between things. Hmm. You do not exist as a congregation or for me to get in the pulpit once a week and just vent. Nope. That which is exact and fixed, number, proportion, harmony, withstands this distortion. Whatever my state, whether vigorous or exhausted, in three miles there or three milestones, that's why number hurts when we are suffering. It interferes with the operation of transference. Hmm. For example... I was just talking about this or listening to this on Friday. I think it was Friday or Saturday. If you know that you have to hold on to this bar for 10 seconds, right? You're hanging from this bar by your fingers and you have 10 seconds. The coach says, you got 10 more seconds. You can hang in there for 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. If the coach says 10 more minutes, you're going to drop. You're going to let go. Right. But the mental exercise to say, he says 10 seconds, I'm going to go 20. Exactly. But it's that number that messes with you. How old are you going to be? I'm going to be 50. Man, 50. How can you keep doing what you're doing? (laughs) Yeah, well, it'd be like this. I mean, imagine if Jesus, you know, when you were young enough to understand, Mm -hmm. laid out your life before you. Correct. How would, what would be your response? Would it be despair? Probably. Mm -hmm. You're going to live to 23. You have five more years to live. Oh, yeah. That's terrible. Right. Is that a, is that, like you said, is that, a cross that's too heavy to carry or that all of a sudden you're liberated from worrying about your mortality to just, I can do whatever I want for the next five years because I'm not going to die until I'm 23. Well, it's like John says of Peter at the end of uh, John's gospel, right? He's going to, you're going to be born away, you know, with your mm-hmm. arms outstretched and like, yeah. ouch, ouch. Mm-hmm. Jesus said that to him before he rose from the, or before he ascended. Yeah. yeah. Peter, you're going to be crucified like I am. So good luck. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why numbers hurt when we're suffering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is why when you present hard data to people, they will reject it for an emotional argument. Whether to suffer more because they, mm-hmm. they love their suffering or yeah. because it looks hopeless then. Right. Yeah. This is an instrumental yeah. battle, but we're going to fight it anyway. Whoa. Or to do this just makes me complicit in the very thing that I claim to be rejecting or... Right. Right. I'm smart enough to know the difference between right and wrong. And you're like, well, here's this, this, the statistics. And you're like, well, that's your opinion. I'm like, well, you told me to cite a legitimate source. Here's the source you pointed me towards. They admit it. So here's the hard data. Well, it doesn't make me feel good emotionally to know that. So therefore, I'm going to ignore the data, call it your opinion, and then continue forward with my emotions. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Good baby. summary. I should yeah. just break that out as a highlight, 30-second highlight. <laughs> That's why numbers hurt. To fix my attention on what is too rigid to be distorted by my interior modifications is to prepare to make possible within myself the apparition, the ghost, of something changeless and an access to the eternal. To fix Hmm. my attention on what is too rigid to be distorted by my interior modifications. So, Jesus doesn't care about your feelings doesn't care about your thoughts, doesn't care about your knowledge or your understanding of things. Because it's a fact. He died. Because it's a fact. He He died. He's a person. He's a real person. (laughs) He exists outside of you. I think, I mean, I think this is why like our hymnody does, you know, focuses on this. Like when I survey the wondrous cross, right? Mm -hmm. On which the Prince of Glory died. And you're like, it's just forcing you to say that's what happened. Yeah. You know, I count all but loss. That's the end. Like, Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Well, that's the reality. This is what it is. And you can't change that. Mm -hmm. So to fix your attention on that, Mm -hmm. it can't be distorted by what's going on inside of me, my feelings, my thoughts, is to prepare to make possible then within myself the apparition of something changeless, Holy Spirit, for example, ghost. Correct. And an access, in her case, to the eternal. This is mysticism. (laughs) It is. I I don't have to go outside of myself to find Jesus. I can go within. Well, but it is like the sacrament. I mean, I think that's where we would go with that, the Lord's Supper. And say, mm-hmm. look, look, it's Christ's body and blood. In one sense, I don't care if you believe it or not. 
Um, I do because I don't want you to receive it to your hurt and harm. Yeah. Um, but it is what it is because he says so, right? Mm -hmm. And by by this, you you have access not only to time but to eternity, right? Because you receive yes. life and salvation. Right. Hundred percent. Hmm. What a what a work. Yeah, it's heavy. It's a lot of heavy stuff, and there's even more stuff at the end of this. <laughs> so maybe we'll come back to it again next week. Well, we can. It's fun talk, <laughs> especially it's so contemporaneous. All right. So that's all I got. Well, yeah, let's play some music. Yeah, let's and play some music. And lead say us goodbye. out. Yeah. Thank, 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 thanks, 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 everybody for listening for supporting the podcast for the encouragement and uh, all that you do to uh, keep us going go check out everything else on the 1517 website support the uh, work at 1517 blogs articles books and so forth otherwise we will talk to you next week for a brand new episode peace uh oh mark's on the list now this show is a wrecking ball but we can't stop listening because we like angels like you stop making me channel line of cyrus well mark <laughs> Mark, do you have a do you have a full sized furry costume in your closet somewhere in your house? <laughs> this is terrible. It's terrible. Are you a furry, Mark? <laughs> I had to extend my uh, my controlled internet time. I finally figured out how to block everybody else from having any kind of substantial access to the internet here while we're mm. recording. <laughs> you were frozen a lot. Yeah, I had to keep I had to keep adjusting it. Yeah. It won't be frozen on the uh on the actual video, just for your on your end. <laughs> two. <laughs> you know two songs? Is that what you're, you're saying? No, two. He's got two full sized furry costumes hanging in his closet at home. Oh, I like it. Yeah, that's true. Mark's Mark's a part of the team. <laughs> he gets it. <laughs> furry costumes. <laughs> oh goodness gracious. So yeah. Um if for those of you who are on the live feed here on YouTube, if you don't know, go to Telegram Band Books because that's where we're posting all of the um, vaccine stuff, COVID stuff. Videos, yeah, because really, it doesn't really belong necessarily in the show, but we always refer to it. Right. And they didn't want to put it in the show notes because then it's just like yeah, no, people get lost in the show notes. That's so true. That's the that's the place to get yeah. it. Yep. You know, it's it's basically like the insider channel, mm -hmm. I guess. Right. So that if you want to be in the know, right. Otherwise, uh, there was, was that article that, did you post that demonic article that I sent to you? I think I in put the, it in there. Didn't I put it in there? That had a lot of links at the bottom of that one too. It did. Yeah, it did. I don't know if I put it in I the television chat. I, I didn't really think that, it, it wasn't the best article in the world. <laughs> he made some no, good not points the first within part. the context, but uh, yeah, towards um, the end there, it was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I can post more stuff in there. I think it's hard just to find sources, so that's good. That's, that seems to be a good place to just drop Denying some Denying the Demonic people. by OffGuardian.org. That's the name of it. Denying the Demonic. Yeah. I think I'm not sure it. if I put it in there or not. But again, regardless of whether you agree or disagree, the links are there. You can do your own reading and your own research and make up your own mind. And at least for me, that's kind of the key point is if you decide you want to get vaccinated, that's your choice, but at least do it with an informed choice. Yeah. I mean, maybe you don't have a problem with aborted fetal cells being, you know, in there. I mean, well, that too. Yeah, or I mean, the not, fact that the I, vaccine killed every animal it was used on. Yeah, well, at least the the ferrets and the it's um, not a vaccine. The mice. No, stop calling it a vaccine. It's not. It's a serum. It's gene therapy. Well, you know what the you know what the etymology of the word vaccine is? It comes from cow, doesn't it? Yeah, it just means it's from the cow yeah, in Latin because that was the it was mm -hmm. the um, it was that vaccine back in um, cowpox, like, smallpox, yeah, smallpox, yeah, smallpox, smallpox. Yeah. Pox. yeah. yeah. And that's something. Yep, that's all it means. And since this one didn't come from cows, what should it be called? Cuidado, cuidado, peligroso. Hmm. Okay. Peligro. Yeah. Um, peligro, not peligroso. That would be. I am dangerous. No, peligro. There we go. Danger. I kill um, evil. We kill evil. Yeah, we kill evil. Otherwise, yeah, we got a lot of stuff to talk about on the show. Obviously, and we'll keep going until we're booted. But um, yeah, it's not getting better. It's not going to get better. It's like I said in the sermon yesterday, God's taken his word away from us. He's left a remnant, but the word's gone. Well, so. I would say he's taking his word away from around us. Us meaning the churches, broadly mm -hmm. speaking. Yeah. I don't want to put yeah. myself outside that, but... Um, no. no, I know. Uh, I mean, we're struggling against it. Churches are closing. Churches are permanently closed. Churches are segregating. It's just like... Oh. Churches are applying medical mandates to their people. Correct. They're compelling people's consciences. For, you, for the forgiveness of sins. 
compelling people's conscience, not with God's word. Correct. Mm -hmm. Which uh, I think that's the problem. Yes, exactly. So we'll keep fighting the good fight as long as we're allowed. Otherwise, we'll just start another podcast. <laughs> or both. Or both. Maybe this summer. I said yeah. after Easter, but the way things are going right now, probably this summer. You got a lot. We got both got a lot on our table. So much. So yeah. much. It's good. So, Keeps us out of right. trouble. The, uh, depends on what kind of trouble you're talking about. <laughs> well, sometimes the things we're doing are causing trouble. Okay. Ending broadcast. Ending broadcast. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Mm,